Hello and welcome to all our viewers again. We're all set uh, to get underway with uh, the latest and greatest uh, session that we have for you on our OnePlay Sports Network. So the speaker for this session uh, is uh, Dr. Jim Parry, who will be speaking about the concept of sports in uh, Olympism. Uh, Dr. Parry, of course, will give you a better sense of uh, what we will be discussing as part of this topic. Uh, but I'll just give a quick introduction of Dr. Parry, after which uh, I shall hand over the reins to him. Uh, so Dr. Jim Parry is uh, a visiting professor in uh, the Faculty of Physical Education and Sports at Charles University in Prague in the Czech Republic. Uh, Dr. Parry, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you on our One Play Sports Network. So uh, you can certainly enlighten the viewers uh, on uh, what you have in mind uh, with regard to your presentation. Okay, shall I kick off now? You can kick off now, Dr. Parry. Jolly good. Let's get started because, hello everybody, uh, I'm afraid <clears throat> this is going to be very quick and uh, I hope you can stay with me because this session is one that normally takes about three hours with a break in the middle to one and a half hour workshop sessions and I'm going to do it in 40 minutes. So hold on to your hats. Uh, we're going to talk about what Olympism is and where it came from. And I'm going to take a different view from uh, the view that you might have found uh, uh, with other presenters. My view is very simple and I'll, I'll announce it now and I'll try to make it come good throughout the 40 minutes. Olympism is not about teaching values. Many people think that Olympic education is a kind of values education. Well, my view is, yes, of course it involves values, but it's not values education. Olympic education is education through sport. Sport, sport, Sport. And anybody who tells you that Olympic education is to do with teaching values in classrooms or teaching values in workshops is somebody who's taking children away from sport and putting them in the classroom. So for me, Olympism is education through sport. And that's why we need to know what sport means. That's why this talk is entitled The Concept of Sport in Olympism. Because the philosophy of Olympism is based on the concept of sport. Okay, so that's what I'm going to be saying, and uh, I'm going to try and make it come, come true now. <clears throat> okay, I begin with uh, I'm getting feedback on my microphone. Would, would people please mute their microphones? Thank you. Um, this is something I do with uh, small children in school. Uh, children aged 9, 10, 11, 12. We, we, we were doing this in 2012 and 2011 because of the Olympic Games. We had the Olympic Games, so we had to do some things in schools. And uh, um, I used to do little sessions like this. So I would ask the kids, what do you think of when I say the word Olympic? And they get all this. Uh, whether they're thinking of the ancient games or the modern games, they get all this. If it's a, a two-week sports thing, would you switch your microphones off, please? I'm getting terrible feedback here. Uh, a two-week multi-sport festival held once every four years between elite athletes representing the uh, cities or the uh, countries in intercommunal competition. Okay, now they understand that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What happened there? Can I get it back on by? There we go. Um, so they get all this. So kids have heard of what Olympic is because, especially in a country that has the Olympic Games, it's in, it's, it's in the newspapers, they read about it, see it on the TV, 
So they know what Olympic means in terms of Olympic Games. Then I ask them, what is Olympiad? Nobody has an idea about this. Well, maybe one or two occasionally know that Olympiad refers not to an Olympic athlete. Some people say, an Olympiad, I know, it's an Olympic athlete. No, it's not. Uh, uh, Olympiad, it's a, it's a particular Olympic Games. No, it's not. Olympiad is a calendar term. It's a four-year period, and Olympiad is a four-year period. And the Games might or might not be held during that period. And uh, three Games were not held, as you know, in the 20th century. So the London Games are properly referred to not as the 30th Games, because they've only been 27, but the Games of the 30th Olympiad, the Games that took place in the 30th four-year period of the Olympiad. Okay. So kids don't get that. I don't expect them to. And then I ask them, uh, I also ask this question of undergraduates in sports science and sports studies courses in universities. What is Olympism? And nobody knows. Nobody knows. You can go to Loughborough University. You can go to any uh, sport university in the UK. And most of the undergraduate students do not know what Olympism means. They've never heard of it. But you know what it means, and let's just rehearse it. Uh, remember we said before that it's a two-week festival, once every four years between elite athletes in intercommunal competition. That's Olympic, right? Olympism, not the elite athlete just, but everybody. Not just a short fortnight, truce period, but the whole of life. Not just competition and winning, but also the values of participation and cooperation not just sport as an activity, but also as a formative and developmental influence. So Olympism means something much more than just Olympic, the Olympic Games. Well, we ask ourselves, what does it mean much more than just a particular Olympic Games? And very summarily, let me say, Olympism is a universal social philosophy which emphasizes the role of sport in world development, in international understanding, peaceful coexistence, and especially social and moral education. That's just a brief statement. Oh, by the way, don't bother writing too much of this down. I'm going to send the PowerPoint and probably a couple of uh, academic papers to the organizers. Uh, uh, and all everything that's on this PowerPoint presentation, you can collect it. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the philosophy of Olympism, if you like. It claims to be a universal social philosophy. And this is exemplified in the Olympic Charter. Look, balanced whole, blending sport with culture and education, joy found in effort, universal fundamental ethical principles, fundamental principle six, peaceful, Educating youth through sport, practiced without discrimination, mutual understanding, friendship, solidarity, fair play. These values are coming out in the Olympic Charter, right? Now, what about the National Olympic Committees? Well, chapter four, actually, I'm working from an old version of the Olympic Charter. I haven't bothered to update it. Why don't you check it out for yourself on the internet and... Uh, see if you can find Olympic values in the Olympic Charter. Okay. Uh, this is what it says about the NOCs. The duties of the NOCs. The mission of the NOCs is to send a team of athletes to the... Oh, no, it doesn't say that. Because everybody thinks, don't they, that the, the main job of the NOC is to send athletes to the Olympic Games and to supervise sport development and the winning of medals and stuff like that. That's what people think the National Olympic Committee is for. Not so. According to the Olympic Charter, the first sentence says, the mission of the National Olympic Committee, not one of the missions, no, not one of the mission, the mission of the National Olympic Committee is to develop and protect the Olympic movement. The, the mission of the NOC is to believe in Olympism and promote Olympism, to propagate the fundamental principles of Olympism at national level, and contribute to the diffusion of Olympism in teaching programs 
and see to the creation of institutions that devote themselves to Olympic education. How many national Olympic committees do that? Not many. The amount of resources devoted to protection of the Olympic movement, propagation of fundamental principles of Olympism, and contributing to the diffusion of Olympism in schools and colleges and universities is tiny. Right. I want you to think about that. The, um, uh, the priority given to Olympic education within the Olympic movement. It's very big in terms of what people say. It's very small in terms of what people actually do and the amount of resources they're willing to put to it. Now, my big question is, we've got a whole bunch of values there. I've just announced a whole bunch of values. Um, how can we systematize this and bring it all together? Well, I tried to do this in, in one of my papers uh, uh, 10, 12 years ago. Um, and I tried to gather together what's been said about the values of Olympism into a philosophical anthropology. Philosophical anthropology is an ideal conception of the human being. Every education system needs a philosophical anthropology, okay? What is the ideal person that this educational system is meant to produce? And this is the philosophical anthropology of Olympism. Individual all-round harmonious development. Do schools do that? I was a school teacher for three years. Many years ago, it doesn't change much. Do British secondary schools strive towards individual all-round harmonious development? No, they don't. 90% of the school curriculum is cognitive. It's to do with learning maths and uh, history and physics and uh, uh, sociology and so on and so on and so on. Most school education is at the desk or at the computer, learning, 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 propositional knowledge. Where's the art? Where's the drama? Where's the creative uh, stuff? Where's the sport? Uh, where's the music? Some schools have this. Many schools don't. Some schools have it, but not much. And nowhere near as much as they have the cognitive so the ideal of individual order and harmonious development is a tough one. And most schools, I don't think, do it. Towards excellence and achievement. Well, of course, you, 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 know, you wouldn't want a school that, that wasn't aiming for excellence and achievement. Through effort, yes, you're not going to do anything unless you make a decent effort. Somebody sends me an essay. It's two pages of rubbish, badly written, uh, Obviously, not taking much time over it. Uh, sometimes when I get those, I send them straight back. I say, I'm going to give this zero. Uh, it's an insult to receive this. Put some effort into it. Show me your best and I'll mark it. We expect effort if you're going to get excellence. It's just natural. It's just normal. But Olympism em emphasizes sporting activity, competitive sporting. So it's effort in competitive sport. Under what kind of conditions? Respect, fairness, justice, equality. Why? With a view to creating lasting personal human relationships. And the rest of the world? Well, international relationships, peace, toleration, understanding. And also, Kubitam always wanted to, to, to ally sport with the arts. Also, cultural alliances with the arts. So that's the kind of thing that you would think of as Olympism, right? Now, let's just look at these values here. Where's your excellence, friendship, and, and respect? Excellence is a little word in number two. Uh, friendship is a little word in number five. Respect is a little word in number four. Look what it misses out. Excellence, friendship, respect. Look what it misses out. Peace. <laughs> doesn't mention peace. International understanding. doesn't mention that. Justice, doesn't mention justice. Equality, these big social and political themes that Olympism stands for in the world, excellence, friendship, respect, doesn't get it, does it? And you wouldn't, uh, I mean, it's no uh, 
fluke that uh, excellence, friendship, and respect turn out to be those values that are touted as the Olympic values, right? Excellence, friendship, respect was invented by the marketing department at the IOC in Lausanne in 1999. They wanted a big push and they wanted a big marketing campaign. And these marketers sitting at the desks and designing uh, logos and stuff, excellence, friendship, friendship, respect. First time I saw it was 99 at the first uh, WADA doping conference in uh, Lausanne, where WADA was set up in uh, September 1999. And the first time I saw it, these huge posters, one with excellence and an athlete, one with friendship with two athletes, one with respect, another athlete. And I thought, oh, that, they're nice. But excellence, friendship, are they Olympic values? No, they're not. Every school in the world wants excellence. Every school in the world wants their kids to be friends. Every school in the world wants their kids to be respectful to each other and to the teachers and the teachers to them. So excellence, friendship, respect, they're just values. They're just ordinary values that everybody has. Every enterprise that deals with human beings has these three things as their values. What does that show? It shows that they're not especially Olympic values, right? They're just values. And that's why if you have an emphasis on values education and you're only thinking about excellence, friendship, respect, you miss out all that's important about Olympism. So I'm gonna try and ask the question, where does all this stuff come from? You know, the friendship, respect, the excellence, the peace, the justice, the toleration, the respect, the fairness, uh, the equality. Where, where do all these ideas and values and uh, ideals, where do they come from? Change gear. Let's ask a question. We're looking for the values of Olympism. Let's look at what sport is. What is sport? Ask the question, what is sport? Now, the way to answer this is through a philosophical technique called conceptual analysis. You analyze the concept of sport and you try to find elements that are logically necessary. Right. So some people say, what is sport? And uh, uh, somebody says, oh, sport, she is fun. And I ask, well, I can see that sport could be fun, but I've also played um, losing 6-0 with 10 minutes to go, and it's raining hard, and it's two degrees, and somebody just stamped on my hand on the floor, and uh, you can go on and on, can't you? It's not fun. When people um, strive for medals in the Olympic Games, what they're doing is not characterizable as fun. They're not hopping around uh, laughing and being happy and tickling themselves, are they? They're engaged in a serious enterprise with all their concentration and might and determination. That's something different from fun. So I want to say that although sport may well be fun, it also may not be fun. And that means that fun is not a logically necessary condition because fun is not necessary to sport. It sometimes goes with sport, but it's not necessary to sport. Now, so what is, what is sport necessarily? I want to say, firstly, it's human, right? Animals don't do sport. Uh, polar bears play in the snow and uh, um, m monkeys uh, run about and jump about in the trees and it looks like they're playing and they may well play. I don't want to deny that animals sometimes play, but what they don't do is sport. You never see a bunch of monkeys saying, right, line up here, first one to the banana tree wins. You don't see that. So sport is necessarily human. What about horses in the Olympic Games? Is that a counter example to my argument? No, because the reason why horses are allowed in the Olympic Games is because they're always under the control of the human. 
The human is a major element in getting the horse to do what it's doing. The human is the one who produces the result. Do you think the horse could remember to hop over those fences in the right order um, uh, and, and uh, to, to, to do that within the time and less encouraged and made to do it by human? Okay, and that's why you don't have greyhound racing, which is another animal sport, because in greyhound racing, you let the dogs off, they run away. Uh, so they're not under the control of the human. So something like greyhound racing could never be an Olympic sport. So sport is human. Secondly, it's physical. All sports are physical. Now, some people say, what about chess? I say, well, chess is not a sport because it's not physical. And some people say, well, look, you move your piece like this. Right? You move your piece like this, don't you? So you're doing something physical. And I say, yeah, yeah, but you're doing something physical when you're reading a book. You know, you're sitting on your backside for a start. That's the physical part of your body, your backside. You're sitting on it. You're reading a book. You're turning the pages like this. That's a physical thing. So is reading a book a sport? Of course not. Well, why not? Because moving the piece like this is not necessary to the outcome. In sport, the physical bit of what you're doing is necessary and produces the outcome. Whereas in, in, in chess, the kind of movement I make to move my pawn to rook's uh, uh, to move my bishop to rook's pawn six. The kind of movement I use is irrelevant to the outcome because I could have made that same movement with my other hand. I could have made the movement with my toe. I could have made the movement with my nose. I could have made the movement by asking you to do it for me and it wouldn't matter. So the nature of the movement is irrelevant to the outcome of the game of chess. So that's the reason why it's not a sport. So sport is human and it's physical. And it's not just physical, jogging's physical, right? But um, it, it doesn't have skill. The difference between going for a jog and having a running race is that you can jog any way you like and nobody cares, right? You don't need any particular skill to go and jog, but you do need skills to run. Race running is a particular skill. And only those who have those skills and train themselves in those skills are going to win. So sports is human physical skill. All Olympic sport as well is a contest. It's a, it's, it's a competition. You can't think of an Olympic sport that is not a competition. It's a, the Olympics is about competitive sport. And in order for there to be a contest, you can't have a contest unless you have a way of knowing who's the winner and who's the loser. And how do you find out who's the winner and who's the loser? The rules tell you who's the winner and who, who, who's the loser. So all sports are rule governed. And finally, all sports are institutionalized. If you want to become a sport, an Olympic sport, you have to start off with small federations and national federations and international federations. It has to be institutionalized in order to count as a sport. And there are rules for this. Um, the Olympic Program Committee only allows on the Olympic program sports that are properly institutionalized. Don't worry about the last one. I'm leaving it out for now. I don't have time. Okay, so we're talking about six things here. And these are all necessary conditions of sport. Sports are necessarily governed by rules. Sports are necessarily skilled. Sports are necessarily competitive, all right? You can't think of one sport that is not a contest, is not skilled, is not rule governed. That's the point. So this isn't just my definition that I put against your definition and, and the, the two definitions, you know, uh, could be on it on equal level. No, this I claim is a conceptual analysis of the concept of sport. And if you don't agree with this, let's have a discussion about it. 
but it will be a genuine argument. It won't just be my version against your version. There will be gen genuine arguments and reasons given uh, to support your point of view. So I'm going to take it as read now that the concept of sport goes like this. A sport is an institutionalized, rule-governed contest of human physical skill. It's a simple one-sentence, short-sentence definition with six terms in it. These six terms are logically necessary conditions for the concept of sport. Now, what does the concept give us? It gives us two things. Number one, it gives us a demarcation criterion. It demarcates what is sport from what is not sport. And this is very important because every National Olympic Committee, every uh, sports ministry uh, has to decide which activities get funding. Who gets money from the sports ministry to develop their sport? Well, of course, everybody wants to get money. So everybody's applying to the sports ministry to be a sport. And the sport ministry has to say, no, you're not. No, you're not. Yes, you are. No, you're not. Yes, you are. The sport ministry and the International Olympic Committee has to have a demarcation criterion. You're, you are sport. You're not sport. Okay. In England, um, uh, contract bridge, a card game applied to be a sport. Obviously, they want some money. Uh, and the British Sports Council said, no, card games aren't sports. Chess has tried many times to do this. The, at the moment, the answer is no. Actually, the IOC has a special category for chess and Go and uh, 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 other board games, and bridge as well, card games. He calls them mind sports. Now, it, this is very interesting. If you call something a, a something sport, it means it's not a sport. So you call some, you call something a mind sport, and everybody thinks, oh, they've agreed that chess is a sport. No, they haven't. The fact that they've put it in the category of mind sport means that they have denied access to the concept of sport. They say you're not a sport. You're a mind sport. You can be a mind sport. So they put them all in my mind sport box. Because people around the world, they call anything they like, they call it sport, right? For various reasons, reasons of their own. They want the concept. Sport is such a good thing. They want to be part of the good thing, okay? So uh, you have lots of things that are not sport that use the word sport, like nature sports. Nature sports are like outdoor activities and outdoor pursuits. They are not sports. Read Kevin Krein on this. Kevin Krein has a great book why nature sports uh, are not sports. He doesn't want to call them nature sports, you see. Uh, I, I noticed that uh, yoga, uh, which is definitely not a sport, not intended to be a sport, now you have people who want to, 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 to develop something called yoga sport. Uh, there's a yoga sport federation now in India. So, uh, so what, 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 do they, what do these guys have to do? In order to make yoga, which is not a sport, into a sport and call it yoga sport what do you have to do they have to make it human physical skill contest rule government institutionalized they have to make sure that yoga becomes an institutionalized rule government contest you know that yoga doesn't involve a contest right yoga is not about contesting against other human beings it's about self-development and self-improvement right so on, on, and on that ground, it's not a sport. So what these guys had to do was they had to invent stuff that made yoga into some kind of contest so that they could claim that yoga was a sport. That just reinforces my thesis that if you want to be a sport, you've got to be these six things. And here's the demarcation criterion. If it's human, not, not animals. If it's physical, not chess. If it's skill, not jogging. If it's contest, not mountaineering. Uh, mountaineering is not a contest. Uh, if, if I move, watch me move on the mountain. I'm moving on the mountain, right? What's the mountain going to do? Basically, a mountain just sits there. I mean, you might get bad weather conditions, you know, the snow and things like that. But there's no contest between you and some other agency that's trying to do something. Mountaineering is a challenge. Can I get to the top? 
It's a kind of test. Can I get there? But it's not a contest because a contest is with others. It's got to be rule governed. So not field sports. Field sports is just get out there and kill something. Field sports where you just bang, 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 bang. No rules. Do it anyhow you like. Of course, you can make a field sport into a sport. For example, fishing. Uh, you know, I don't know how to fish. I never did it. But if I went to my local park and threw a hook into a, into the river and tried to get some fish, I can do it any way I want. doesn't matter. I'm just fishing, right? But if you want a sport, then you have to have rules. Like angling. Angling is fishing sport. So they give you a, a certain number of meters of the riverbank. They, you have to weigh your catch. You can only use this kind of hook, not this kind of hook. There are rules and regulations that govern angling. There aren't rules and regulations that govern field sports. And institutionalization, hula hooping was never institutionalized. I suppose it could have become a sport, but it never did. Uh, incidentally, one of the reasons why esports will never become a proper sport is because they can't be institutionalized because the code and the product is owned by an individual. It can't be properly institutionalized. Like nobody owns cricket. There might be bodies like the ICC that runs cricket, right? That they don't own cricket. Nobody owns cricket. Nobody owns football. Yeah? But somebody owns Game of Thrones and gets profit directly from it and organizes events just for Games of Thrones for himself and uh, his company, right? That's not institutionalization. Okay, so the concept of sport gives you a demarcation criterion. These six criteria tell you what sport is not, as well as telling you what sport is. Now here comes the tricky move. Tricky move is this. From these logically necessary conditions, there flow a range of values. If sports are necessarily human, it suggests that you've got a concern for the development of the human. If sports are necessarily physical, you're going to uh, rely on effort for your results, in part. If it's skilled, you have to be committed to the development of human capacities. You want to get better at it, more skilled. So the idea of practice and training and education comes into the idea of skill. We value practice and coaching and education in sport because it's skilled, because it's a contest. There has to be a contract contest. That's to say, when I walk over the white line onto the football pitch, I enter a different world. It's like I'm in a magic circle. Different rules apply. What I can, I can barge people. I can tackle people. You try going into in the bus queue on the way home today. Go in the bus queue and try and barge somebody in the bus queue. They won't like it because you're not supposed to barge people in the street. But on the football field, you can barge people as long as you do it legitimately. So there's this contract which says... Yes, it's all right for you to come and barge me if it's all right for me to come and barge you. We make a contract contract that in this particular game, there are certain rules and I'll accept the rules, you accept the rules. I promise to honor the rules, so do you. Let's play. So um, this contract lies at the basis of sport, a contract of trust. Uh, it's the same as the kind of contract that lies at the basis of all society. All societies are based, in the last analysis, on trust of the other person, on the shake hands, on the contract. Uh, and the contest, of course, uh, directs us towards the values of competition and excellence, but also uh, the value of cooperation, because competition is not conflict. Sporting competition is impossible without deep levels of cooperation, right? You have to cooperate in order to produce the game. I can't even take part 
in a contest, in a competition, unless I've agreed to enterprise altogether. And one of the things that, that cooperation does is it produces rules. And if the activity is rule governed, as soon as you have a set of rules, you have fairness, equality and justice. Think of things that happen in sport and think of how people talk about them. You know, think about uh, mancadding in cricket or think about um, uh, people spot fixing um, and, and bowling a wide or a no ball, a certain ball in the over and manipulating the, um, the betting and so on and so on. People talk in terms of fairness and equality between the teams. If you can do that, I can do it. If I agree I'm not going to do that, neither should you. Incidentally, this is what's wrong with doping. People will tell you what's wrong with doping is that it's, it's, uh, it, it, it makes you unhealthy and uh, uh, that, uh, and, and, uh, that uh, it's, it's bad as a role model uh, for the kids and so on. So no, the main reason why doping is wrong is because you said you wouldn't. You had a contract to contest. The Olympic oath says, I promise that I have prepared myself ethically for the upcoming tournament. It says I have not doped. So, so any dope head has to tell a lie at the Olympic Games in order to compete, has to tell a lie, has to be false. So, and if, and if you're found out, justice will hit you, mate. Don't worry. And that's formal and informal justice. The formal justice, they'll ban you for, for some years. And informal justice is, we know who you are. We know you're a cheat. We know you're a liar. We know that you entered into the competition on unfair, unequal terms. And that is not just to do a bad thing, is to undermine the basis, the very basis of sport. Why? because you're undermining the logically necessary conditions of sport, right? And institutionalized, that brings lawful authority to implement the rules. So you get uh, referees and judges and all that kind of stuff. Right, okay, so we have the concept of sport, um, which sets out our logically necessary conditions. The concept gives us a demarcation criterion to tell us what is and what is not sport and the logically necessary conditions from them fall out a set of values. Now, I ask you to look at those values. Development of the human, effort, contract, competition, excellence, fair play, equality, justice, law, respect, etc., etc. These, I want to claim, are the real values of Olympism. That's where Olympism comes from. Some people say that um, uh, Olympism was invented by this genius, de Coubertin, who out of his own head spun this uh, I wonderful idea of Olympism. And uh, that's where it comes from. And we all have to believe in, we all have to believe in uh, de Coubertin. No, it's, it's not like that at all. De Coubertin was a, a social observer. He was an early sociologist. And all de Coubertin did, which was a wonderful thing, was to notice what was already there. It's very difficult to do that. These days, you know, we're getting uh, riots in the United States um, uh, uh, based on... The, the, problems with the police and uh, and racism, okay. Now, is that what's happening? Does that justify people just raiding stores and just taking everything out of an electric, electrical store? You know, freezers and dishwashers and so, all being stolen, nothing left in the store. Is that really about police brutality or is it just people engaging in criminal activity? Well, look, it's very difficult to know because it's here now, and you see a bit of news and a bit of this and a bit of that. And it's very difficult to get an overview and to see what the hell is actually going on, to see what kind of explanations we can give that are good explanations. Right, 
This is what de Coubertin did. He saw what was already there. He saw the birth of sport. He saw sport emerging, as he thought, going to be a major force in popular culture. And from the start, he saw the values that are already necessarily in sport. If you want to have sport, you have to have certain values. Eh? Th those values are the basis of sport. So some people think uh, Olympism gives values to sport. It's the, other way, it's, it's the other way around. Sport is where Olympism gets its values from. That's what, that was the genius of de Coubertin. So sport has become so important in everyday life just because sport encapsulates and represents those everyday values that are present in any approach to civilized and well-organized communities anywhere in the world. And that's why sport is universalizable. Art is not universalizable. Art is culturally specific. Uh, Indian art is completely different from African art and from European art. So in order to understand uh, an art form, you really have to understand the community within which uh, it was born and it continues to exist. Well, universal um, uh, values are not like that. They're values that anybody anywhere can recognize because they're human values, right? And sport, not art, is universalizable. And that's what gives it its power. So I say, don't look to the heavens for inspiration. Don't look to ideology for guidance. Just look at sport. Try to understand the logical basis of sport. Then you'll see where the ideology comes from. What gives the ideology its sense and its meaning? And then you'll see what sports values are and what they must be. Everyday sport in everyday life is full of value and it's the source of Olympism. And I want to say also, it's the basis of Olympic education. Sport, sport, sport. Thank you very much. Has everybody gone to sleep? Dr. Ragbir Singh Man. Yes. So Dr. Dr. Parry has concluded uh, his presentation. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, Dr. Ragbir Singh Man, do you have anything in mind? Uh, maybe, I believe uh, this is Aurora may have a question. Uh, okay, Sunita Aurora, I can uh, see. Yeah, and Dr. What uh, you thank you, sir. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Dean Perry. Uh, it was a wonderful and informative pre presentation. Uh, as the Olympics were started, not only to promote sports, but to spread humanity, love, brotherhood in the people of the different countries. But now, just I wanted to ask that do you really think that real spirit of Olympism is followed during uh, Olympic Games? Can you hear me? Yes, sir? That's a good question. That's a good question because um, let me approach it from a slide. Uh, would people switch off their microphones, please? Thank you. Um, let me approach it from the still microphones on. I, I, it, it, okay. Um, uh, you would think, wouldn't you, that um, the uh, International Olympic Committee would be the place on earth where Olympic values were respected and observed, wouldn't you? You would expect that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Do you find that? Do, do you really find that? I don't find that at all. I think uh, many of the decisions that are taken um, by the IOC are commercial decisions. Um, or decisions based on sports politics and not decisions based on rationality and Olympic principles. And I'm continuously disappointed by that. 
Um, so you ask, uh, are the Olympic principles um, uh, observed at the Olympic Games? I think probably they are observed more at the Olympic Games than they are anywhere else in athletic competition. So if you go to any world championships, I think you'll find that the Olympic Games, uh, people are more respectful of Olympic values uh, than, uh, uh, than, than in, in other places. And the IOC makes a big thing of having no advertising around the track. You know, for many years, it was one of the few sporting venues where there was no commercialism involved and so on and so on. And I think that the IOC does try, or parts of the IOC, they do try to justify their decisions on the basis of Olympic values. But I'd like to see a lot more of that. Fantastic. Thank uh, you, sir. Hope for the best. <laughs> brilliant. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Rakesh Malik. Uh, Dr. Malik, I believe you have a question as well. Dr. Rakesh. Dr. Malik, uh, you're on screen. Uh, you're on mute right now. But I believe you have a question as well. Yes, you've unmuted yourself. Uh, go ask your question, Dr. Malik. He's muted again. Dr. Malik, you're on mute again. You had unmuted yourself uh, for a second, but then uh, you reverted to mute. If you could just unmute yourself and then ask your question to uh, Dr. Perry. That's right. Jim, very well. We can't hear you. Will you start again? Doc, Dr. Malik, Dr. Malik, you keep uh, muting yourself. Uh, you unmute yourself for a jiffy and then uh, for some reason it gets mute again. There you go. That, sh that should be good, Dr. Malik. Try saying something. Jim, I'm audible to you now. Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Malik. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you very much. A beautiful and athletic position. Uh, irrespective of your health conditions. So I congratulate you for this presentation. Uh, I have one question, uh, rather it's a question, not a question, but it's a query. How will you take the view of nationality in respect to the Olympism? Because uh, whenever we talk about the Olympic Games, it's uh, always a, a prestige issue among the national nations, countries. So how do you take the nationality uh, in reference to the Olympism? Yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, again, a, good, a very good question. It, there are huge problems uh, to do with um, nationhood. And the problem with being an international organization like the IOC is in your very name, you have the word international. Now, you can only be international if you accept the concept of nation. So if you're an international uh, organization, you're committed to the idea of nationhood. And that gives you a lot of problems. Uh, we, you know, we, very simple to name, just the Taiwan, uh, China, Republic of China problem. Uh, over 40 years, 50 years, that's been an issue. Um, and the, the, the birth of uh, new countries Kosovo, for example, is it a country or not? Uh, it's now got recognition from uh, UEFA to take part in uh, uh, European football competitions. But does it have permission? Is it a recognized country for the uh, IOC? I don't think it is. So you're right. It's a big problem for organizations. But maybe you were asking a different question, um, a question about the evils of uh, political nationalism. And uh, we don't really have time to go into that, I'm afraid. But uh, my general line would be something like this. Uh, the nation 
has been the primary political concept of the 20th century. The idea of creating nations, making nations, uh, has been the big political project of the 20th century. Now, whether it be so important in the 21st century with the breakdown of barriers and uh, um, uh, so much uh, migration, and so, who knows? <laughs> My own country, uh, I'm in Czech Republic now, was invented in 1919. So it's, it's only 100 years old. When was India uh, last reconstituted? 1946, 48, was it? So there, there are lots of uh, changes so and so on. And I have no crystal ball. I don't know where it's going to go. Brilliant. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. So that's it's really. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry. Thank you so much, Mr. Malik, uh, for your question. Apart from a question, it's always a question. It's always a question. Yes. So that's uh, that's all we had time for in terms of uh, Q and A. Uh, Doctor Ragbir Singh Man, uh, would you like to perhaps uh, conclude? And Doctor Parry, I'll come to you as well uh, in case you have any concluding remarks. Uh, Doctor Man. Doctor Man, I think you're on mute right now. Doctor Man, I believe you're trying to say something, but you're on mute. Okay. You're on. Unmuted. Yes. Okay. Am I audible now? Yes, Dr. Man, if you could conclude proceedings for us. Okay, okay. Jim Perry, thank you very much for your side of view as, as regards the Olympism and the values, etc. We talk about the values inherent in the sports, which is nobody is able to see. But you have tried to show them that in sports, these values are inherent there. So thank you for that. I had one question for you from my side, that is idealism as well as realism. The same problem is there. The idea is in your mind and realism is in front of you. That is what you talked in your speech today. So Yes, that's right. I mean, uh, that's, that's absolutely correct. And uh, you, you were right in your first point that what I'm trying to do here is to exhibit the internal values of sport. And this is a very important job because it's not me telling you what the values of sport are. It's me trying to understand sport, same as you. You, you have the same job as me. Right? You're trying to understand sport. I'm trying to understand sport. And so my answers are not my answers. They're, 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 they're the answers that come from sport. And I could be wrong, and then you, you show me I'm wrong. That's okay. Because if you show me I'm wrong, give me a better account, then my account's better. So this is meant to be, it's meant to be a theoretical, objectivist account. It's not meant to be my opinion. Okay. So, and... Because I do think the sport does have internal values. Sport has internal values. Now the question is, what are they? And as, as you say, my, my, my job, my first job was to just explain what I think they are. Uh, the second one, realism and idealism. Well, this is the per perennial problem, isn't it? Realism, you have to deal with what's there in front of your nose. But how do you do that? How do you deal with reality? And part of my answer is you can't, you're not equipped to deal with reality unless you have some values, some ideas, some ideals that you're working towards. That's what enables you to deal with the present, the present day. So ideals aren't just very fairy pie in the sky in the future things. They're things that you're working towards all the time. And uh, my final word, if you don't mind, uh, is uh, yes, to sir. say thank you very much for inviting me. I've, I've really, really enjoyed the session. And uh, I wish I were there with you. 
And uh, I wish I had more time to develop these ideas and to hear, hear your ideas uh, and try to improve my own. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry. The pleasure was certainly ours. Uh, and I'm pretty sure in the future we can uh, we can probably have a, a subsequent conversation. And uh, on behalf of everyone watching, on behalf of uh, Dr. Ragbir Singh Man, uh, Ms. Uh, Sunita Arora, me, we wish you a very, very speedy recovery as well. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Uh, so that was uh, a fascinating session uh, that was moderated by Dr. Ragbir Singh Man and presented uh, by uh, Dr. Jim Parry. Thank you so much for having joined us uh, for the session. Thank but stay tuned. We have uh, two more sessions left uh, before we uh, conclude uh, with uh, the sessions uh, side of things. But we also have the, the valedictory ceremony or the closing ceremony at uh, 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Uh, so we're all set uh, to kick things off uh, with uh, the next session that's on the cards, uh, which will be moderated by Major Ashwin Pogula, who's a, a consultant uh, in uh, sports management uh, and CSR, CSR here being corporate uh, social responsibility, and he's based uh, in India. And uh, Major Ashwin will uh, give you a better sense of uh, who the speaker is uh, for this presentation, and uh, he will also also introduce uh, the topic to you such that you have an idea of uh, what will be discussed over the course of the next 45 to 50 minutes. Uh, and uh, as always, keep uh, your questions rolling in uh, such that I can pick out uh, some of the best uh, questions uh, and uh, broadcast them on the front screen. Uh, take care. Major Ashwin, over to you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You're audible. I believe you're trying to share your screen as well, right? No, not not me. Yeah, now it's fine. Now it's fine. Got it. I believe then it could have been someone else uh, trying to share his or her screen. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, you can you can start. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, to uh, One Place Sports, uh, Indian Olympic Education Committee, and uh, Indian Olympic Education for giving us this chance to be here today in this wonderful seminar webinar on Olympism. I think it's a one thing to promote the spirit of Olympic education, and it should be benefit to all stakeholders in the in the uh, community. Uh, it's an honor for me to be out here. I also would like to introduce our esteemed guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Uh, Gary Bernstein. I'll read out this quick introduction to all of you for your perusal. Dr. Gary is an entrepreneurial leader, university professor, and nonprofit executive who brings an un unparalleled set of skills and experiences to his students and clients. He has demonstrated a keen ability to identify and implement strategies aimed at elevating an entire organization. The record of success uh, combined with his extensive history of building and inspiring teams allows him to immediately and positively impact the lives of others. Dr. Bernstein has earned an impressive reputation for organizational leadership, fundraising, consulting, and executive management. Dr. Gary's main skills encompass sports marketing, strategic planning, and corporate sponsorship, board and donor development, campaign fundraising, as well as event and facility management. In addition to being recognized for highly meritorious achievement, both in teaching and advising, Dr. Bernstein has been deeply involved in the area of community engagement, corporate social responsibility, and major gift fundraising. He brings decades of practical non-profit administration and leadership experiences to his clients. Dr. Gary also has authored two textbooks uh, titled one, The Principles of Sports Marketing with Sagamore Publishers, and second, Non-Profit Recreation and Sport Organizations, Principles and Practices of Leadership and Management. Today's topic, uh, we are going to be speaking about moving from transactional to transformational fundraising with an expertise we hope to learn today on how fundraising would be applicable to the sports sector and how we can create champions with a very conducive and futuristic way of uh, having association we welcome you sir thank you for joining us today and we look forward to hearing your views thank you major ashwin it was Thank you for that introduction. I appreciate that very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to be back, uh, being with you on this international webinar. And uh, today's topic is about fundraising. I know it's something that probably uh, a lot of you 
struggle with or to think about, you're probably thinking fundraising. You want me to ask you for money? And that's what we get all the time in the nonprofit sector when we work with our staff, when we work with our volunteers, when we work with our board members. Don't, don't ask me to ask anybody for money. It's like a dirty word. And sometimes it gets caught in your throat. It's hard to get it out and speak when you say, would you like to consider contributing to our cause? Would, we, would you consider supporting our effort? Sometimes it's, a, it's very hard for people to ask others for money. People they know and also people they don't know. But one thing you have to think about is that the fact is it's not about you. It's about your organization. It's not for your personal profit. It's to help those children, those, those, those homelessness, those issues, those social issues, whether it's in university life, whether it's receiving a gift to help the cancer patients in a hospital, whether it's to support your, your after school activities, whether it's your sports clubs. Basically, what we're going to talk about today is how you can cultivate and solicit donors for the benefit of your organization or cause. It's really not about asking for money. It's more about how you can share your organization's story. I can give you many examples about how we used to go out and ask people for money and people will say, well, what is it for? Who is it going to benefit? How can I, uh, you know, how can I make a difference in other people's lives? You're basically saying, we want to give you an opportunity to join me and others in this great experience of changing people's lives for the better. That's really what it's all about. It's really not about the money. It's about how we can make our community stronger, safer, and and um, and and, uh, and just how you can make your your and, and help and hopefully change people's lives for the better. So where do you start? Good question. You start with the mission. The mission of your organization, because everything begins and ends with the mission. The mission is really like your 30-second elevator speech. If we were stuck in an elevator together from the lobby to, to say, the third floor, and I come up and I ask you, please tell me about yourself, or tell me about your organization, can you describe to me in 30 seconds what we call your elevator speech, what your brand is, what your mission is, what you're in business for, how your organization is critical to the, the fabric of your community. Your mission statement primarily tells people why your organization exists. An example of a mission statement, when you look at, say, the Special Olympics, the mission of the Special Olympics is to provide year-round sports training and athletic competition in a variety of Olympic-type sports for children and adults with intellectual disabilities. If you look at the mission statement of Magic Bus, Magic Bus empowers at-risk children and youth in India to break the cycle of poverty through education, leadership, and employment. So if I'm coming to you and I'm a member of the Special Olympics, a fundraiser for the Special Olympics, or if I'm a fundraiser for Magic Bus, or if I'm a fundraiser raising funds for the local hospital, or if I'm a fundraiser raising funds for the local university or college, I've got to tell you why we're in business. What's our mission? What do we hope to achieve? What's our bottom line? How are we, how is your money? How is your support? How is your contribution 
going to impact my organization. It's not, it's not about buildings. It's about the people in the buildings. It's about how you can improve the lives of those people that you're serving. So again, whether you're an Olympics or a physical educator in a school or university, you've got to think of what the, 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 the emotional tie, the emotional strings that you can tug on to encourage people to want to um, support your, your cause or your organization. There are certain core values in fundraising that everybody should take away from this webinar today. The, the very first core value is that people give to people and good causes too. It's about you. What kind of person are you? If, you are, if you're able to develop relationships with people, you've got it made. If you if you look at my the books that I've written, there's a common theme that runs through both of my, my books. It's all about networking and developing relationships. That is the key. Again, it's not about the building, but what happens in the building. It's about the people you serve. That's what tugs on heartstrings. There's four steps to fundraising. The first step is identification. You want to be able to identify those prospective donors that you want to reach out to to support your cause. So how do you do that? You sit down with your staff, you sit down with your volunteers, you sit down with members of your organization, and you develop a list. And the list is all the people that you know friends, family, colleagues, business owners, sport owners, corporations, businesses, people that you have somewhat of a knowledge and, and relationship with. You identify. The first, first cycle, first step in fundraising is identifying. Who are the people on my prospect list that I can go after? And again, that could be individuals. That could be corporations and businesses. That could be endowments. That could be uh, restricted funds and various foundations. There's a lot of different support. In the United States this past year, the level of giving was over $400 billion. Now, I don't know how that translates to the dollars in India, but that's a significant amount of money that was raised in the United States last year. And that, that amount keeps going up every year. 72% of that over $400 billion that were raised comes from individuals. Comes from individuals. So what does that tell you? That tells you that you need to start making and develop relationships with people that's the key. The second step in fundraising is cultivation. Cultivating a relationship. What does that mean? That means I can't just come to you and say, would you like to support my organization and give a gift of $500, $1,000, $5,000? $5, I, don't, I don't even know you. you. We don't have a relationship. You know, I may, I may, I may give you a couple of dollars because I, you know, I, I heard something about you and your organization and the good work you do, but that's that's very superficial and it it doesn't have a very long lasting effect on the relationship that you want to build with that particular donor. So by cultivating that relationship, you you talk with them, you meet with them, you go to lunch with them, you invite them to your organization, you give them a tour. You, you send them notes, you send them pictures, you invite them to come in. You want to educate them about the, your mission and the work that you do in your organization, in your, in your agency. You want to find out what their needs are, what their interests are. The idea then is you want to connect your needs of the organization to the interests of that particular donor. 
So it's a very simple equation. Needs of your agency, organization, or sports club, if you take the needs plus the interest of that potential donor, needs plus interest equals what? The gift. Needs plus interest equals ultimately getting the gift the support that you want. So cultivation is developing that relationship. Once you've cultivated that relationship, and that takes time, folks, next comes the actual solicitation. Soliciting someone for a gift takes time, takes practice. And then once the person, the donor, the prospect gives you the gift, then of course the final step in the cycle is the appreciation. So those are the four steps of, fund, of fundraising. So let me just recap for, for, for a quick second about one of the most important themes and most important steps in fundraising. Tell me, everybody. Developing relationships. You got it. You want to reach out to these people. Bring them into your organization. Engage them into the life of your organization. Here's an example. I live in northeastern Pennsylvania, which is about two, two and a half hours from New York City. So you got to get an idea that I'm on the northeastern part of the United States. One of the things that my organization does is that we help feed the hungry. We help to feed the needy. We have a food bank, a pantry, that families in need who are very poor come to us and we provide them with nourishment, with food. We feed the hungry. There's also a local foundation, a very popular foundation. So what I did was I invited the, the executive of the foundation to come into my organization. I gave him a tour. I showed him our food pantry. I had to meet some of my staff and volunteers. And uh, this was just not one time. This was phone calls and emails and on-site visits. And ultimately, there was a uh, opportunity that I met with him. So first I identified the donor. The second step was what? Cultivating. So the cultivating process was bringing him in, talking to him, showing up the need showing what the impact that we have in the community of helping people by feeding the people, nourishing. He was so impressed with the work that we did. The next week I got a check from him for $25,000. His interest was about feeding the hungry. This was one of his key interests. So his interest Plus my need equals what? You got it, the gift. Fundraising is more than just money. If you're fundraising just to raise money, you're, you're not fulfilling your, the main job here. Fundraising is about the people, developing relationships with people. Once you do that, the money will come. And let me give you a little advice here. When you want to go out and ask people for money, you don't ask them for money. What do you ask them for? You ask for advice. You write that down. You ask for advice. Give me your input. Tell me what you think. Tell me what your interests are. Once you ask for advice, everyone loves to give their advice to you, right? Once you get their advice, the money will come after that. So fundraising is more than just raising money. It's about the magic of developing meaningful relationships. Now here's another concept in fundraising that I think was important for you all. We have what we call an 80-20 rule, 80-20. So what does that mean? That means if you have 100% full complement of donors, 80% of your donors 
will raise 20% of your money and vice versa. The highest portion of your donors, the 20%, 10 to 20% of your donors will raise the bulk of your money, 80% of your money. So where I'm going next is, is to show you that you need to spend your time with the 20% of your prospect list because that's going to raise you the bulk of your money. The larger gifts, the meaningful gifts, the major gifts, those come from 20% of the people because those are the ones going to give you 80% of, uh, of your goal. So the topic of today's conversation was about transactional versus transformational fundraising. For those of you who are not familiar with those terms, transactional is about low level fundraising, low level fundraising. An example of that, a transaction, when you go to the store, you go to the market, it's basically, I'll give you a dollar and you give me the drink. I'll give you the money and you give, okay, so there's a transaction, right? And usually in fundraising, when you talk about transactional fundraising, it's a quid pro quo. A quid pro quo means more or less this for that. It's a give and take. It's quick. It's easy. There's no long-term commitment. You come in, I give you the cash, you give me the, the product, boom, boom, boom. It's quick and it's easy. For the, the key takeaway for fundraisers is that while Gaining transactions might be worthwhile framework at the very beginning of the relationship. It's not long lasting. It's not long lasting. So some examples of transactional fundraising, you, you have an event, I want to sell you a raffle ticket. $5, you get a raffle ticket to win this prize. You attend a special event. You have a, a bake sale a car wash, you may have a 5K uh, fun run, a 5K walk run. People sign up, they pay their $20, whatever they pay, they run for their 5K to support your cause. And it's, it's easy, it's quick, boom, boom, boom. There's nothing long lasting about it. Last year, two years ago in the United States, you may have heard about this, uh, this fundraiser, the organization is the ALS. It's the uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. It's a uh, disease that affects the nervous system of, of individuals. You, you may have heard this uh, disease everywhere. Lou Gehrig was a former baseball player for the New York Yankees in the 1930s and 40s who contracted this disease, and now they have it named after him. Okay, so the ALS, the ALS um, organization ran this transactional fundraiser. It was called the Ice Bucket Challenge. You may have heard about it. It was a very simple thing. People would go on the line, they would go on Facebook, they would get a bucket of ice, literally a bucket of ice, and they would take the bucket and they would put it over their head and they would throw the ice bucket on their head and they would donate $50, $100 to the ALS. They raised over millions and millions of dollars for this fundraiser that went viral on Facebook. Great fundraiser, raised a lot of money, but guess what? They never developed the relationship with the donors. The millions of donors who donated $50, $100 to the cause they never went to the next step by de further developing a relationship with those donors. So as successful as that transactional fundraiser was for that ice bucket challenge, they never really captured those, those donors for a long-term commitment. It was one and done. I give you the check. I get the ice bucket on my head. I help a cause, but that was it. That was the final. So you want to move your donors from this transaction to a more of a transformational level. So transformational gifts, let me tell you, are amazing. 
they're amazing because you spent the time in developing the relationship with your particular donor. They're very rarely impulsive. These gifts are not impulsive at all. They're, the donor is sophisticated. He, has done, he or she has done their research. They know about you and your organization. They know about your cause. And why? Because you spent the time cultivating them and, and sharing with them the needs that you have in your organization. So you're, again, getting back to you're building that relationship with your donor, and they will be with you forever. So again, invite them to your organization. Give them a tour. Have lunch with them. Take them to dinner. Invite them to your food drive. If you have a, an award ceremony where you're giving out certificates or trophies to your kids in your after-school program, ask them to present the trophies or the certificates to the kids. Get them in your building. Get them in your agency. Get them to see the impact that you're making in the community, how you're, how you're making a difference in your community. If you're a magic bus, show them the impact you're making by getting the kids off the street and involved in active and healthy and sports type of activities, whether it's playing football or, or cricket or whatever sport, badminton that you're playing. So transformational fundraising has, a, has an impact and it's, it's passionate and it captures the donor's heart. You tug at their heartstrings. It's not about taking money from them. It's about giving your donors purpose. Remember, here's another key learning gold bit right here, a bit of gold. The number one the most effective way of fundraising is what? You have, let me ask you the question. Is it by writing your potential donor a letter? Is it by calling them up on the telephone? Is it sending them a solicitation through email? Or is it meeting with their donor face-to-face? -face? Let me ask you those again. See, see how many, if you want to go on the comment line and, and write your answer now, we can see what uh what your what your responses would be to that question what do you think is the most effective way of fundraising is it through a letter write a letter send it out asking them for a donation is it through a call phone call pick up the phone and call them up and say hey we're having this event we want your support please support us write us a check is it through an email everyone loves email today it's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful way to communicate. Or is it meeting face-to-face -face with that individual? I'm looking at the comments. I don't see anything being uh, uh, listed here. But all right, since we're, we want to make sure we get everything done on time, I'm going to give you the answer. If those of you who said that the most effective form of fundraising is through face-to-face -face solicitation, you're right, you win a prize, okay? Pat yourself on the back. If those of you who say getting money through a letter, the phone, or email, those are, those are effective ways of raising money, but not as effective as raising money face-to-face. -face. Okay, so I'm gonna conclude here with a couple of comments, and then I'll pass it back to Major Ashwin. Um, the, last, the last thought that I have to share with you Again, going back to the beginning, we're, we're talking about moving from a transactional to a transformational level of giving. Hopefully, you've picked up some concepts and values of, of fundraising, how, what's important, the four steps of fundraising. The key takeaway here is developing relationships developing relationships with your prospective donor. You want to make sure that it's impactful, that it's passionate, that it's long-lasting. 
with a long lasting relationship will make a very major impact on your organization. But don't forget, this takes time. Anything worthwhile takes time. So you have to invest the time, the hard work in developing, identifying, developing, and cultivating those relationships. So invest in the impact. Ask yourself the question, how can I better develop this relationship with this prospective donor? Are you inspiring them to make a real investment in your organization or cause? If you're not tugging at the heartstrings, then you're not 100% doing your job. Transformational fundraising, folks, this is what major gift fundraising is all about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gary. That was really a wonderful insight uh, and very applicable to, to, to today's times. I think uh, across the world today, fundraising is very important because one needs to understand uh, a longer association, as you rightly mentioned, and not a short term check giving. I think overall across the world, whether it is the cause of sports or any other cause in the world today, the fundraising is primarily uh, applicable for an association to be formed. Uh, people have to understand that we are there to create some value. Uh, if I go as a foundation or an, a sports academy and I go to a corporate and the corporate says, fine, this is what you do. This is what we do. And we join hands together and then we create as an end result. And we make a champion or we impact grassroots or we impact the sporting process or we impact the Olympic movement. As you rightly said, the. Uh, it's very clear and very uh, understandable that we have to understand the overall value association and not just worry about the money coming in. If there is value, money always comes in. Uh, but Gary, I, I, I had a small point to ask you. Uh, one challenge we face in the sports sector, especially in India, and taking your views. Am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 So uh, just to uh, seek your view on the challenge today in a country like India, where uh, CSR has got 10 clauses in, in its uh, CSR law. We are looking at sports as one of them. It's very important for us to speak about the relevance of sports. So the understanding of the corporate is that are you an uh, academy to just train in the evening for sports people? Or are you doing a comprehensive Olympic program? Or are you doing a grassroots program? Are you doing how long will it take to create champions? So these are questions which we grapple with. So just want to uh, take your views that how do we increase the relevance of sports, particularly in CSR, and making an Olympic champion as a result of the association? Very, very good question, Major. Um, Again, I, I, my, my feeling is this, and I, and I like to keep things simple. I'm a simple person, so I like to keep things simple. So I, I, I look at it as it's not so much about the sport or the activity, but what the impact it has on the children or the, or the, the participants in that program. If I'm able to take kids off the street and deal with social issues like homelessness and drug abuse and and uh, child neglect and uh, drink, underage drinking and smoking. If I can take those kids out of those sections and pull them out and put them in a sports um, uh, arena, and by playing in that sport, they're removing them from this these, the social ills that they may be facing, and you have a, you have a, um, the results, the results show that X percent of the people that you've taken out of the street and put them into this program are now law-abiding citizens, or that they're now practicing safe sex, or that they're more engaged in sport activity than being in a gang or taking drugs. 
you show those statistics to that potential donor and they're going to support your efforts. But if you're just asking, we want your money to support our program, well, what's the impact? What's the outcomes? If the outcomes are positive, if the impact is positive, and I can see that your organization is making a difference to strengthen the community, then I'm going to support your, your cause or your organization. So again, whether it's a sports organization, a nonprofit organization, if, if you come to me, now I know this may be different in India, and we talked about this briefly the other day, Major, about Pepsi as an example. Pepsi is one of those yeah. companies in the United States that provides some outstanding funding for youth sports program. If I'm having a youth yeah. sports event, I'll go to Pepsi and they'll come out and they may donate uh, 14 cases of water or drink for our cause because they believe in corporate social responsibility. So I don't know. Hopefully that answered your question. Yes. yes. Uh, in fact, you're right because uh, that's what also, uh, I also feel that the overall uh, culture of the country, uh, Dr. Gary, also is very important to understand the priority of the CSR clause. Uh, it could be different for USA or India, could be different for Australia. As a country, what are the priority in CSR clauses is what is the biggest challenge today. So uh, depending on the overall sporting culture, one can decide. And as rightly said, when in India, when we go to a corporate to speak about an association for long term programs, we do say that we are supporting a community, we're supporting livelihoods, we're supporting the harnessing of the energy of a sport and diverting that into a very uh, positive energy and conducive growth of a champion. We speak about comprehensive growth. Uh, they need to adopt an athlete for Olympic program when they are 10 or 11 years. And for the four or five years of growth and development, we are psychologically growing a champion. So as you mentioned, we do speak about the impact, the social impact, the upliftment of society or the upliftment of the community. Definitely, you're, you're totally right when you speak about that. I think it's all about the relevance to the situation uh, in the country. So my point to make is that it could also be very democratic. Is a bigger clause for cancer or bigger clause for health sanitation or say COVID, for example, or education. So that creates a problem to push sport into the limelight. And that's where sport can do a very big thing because sport can also speak about a nation development activity. Sport has education, sport has upliftment, sport has got growth and development. It has got societal uh, community uh, benefits. So I think sport is much more holistic in nature. It's just that we need to convince the corporates to understand this concept particularly. You're, you're, you're a very smart man, Major Ashwin. You, you, you really hit it on the head. And um, it's, it's really, it's about, you know, not only developing those relationships, but tugging at those heartstrings. I've worked with a group here in the United States, in New York, in fact, and they run a camp, a, a summer camp for kids with cancer. So every summer they bring hundreds and hundreds of kids together and they don't ask for any money from the parents of those families with kids with cancer. So this, this camp for a, the whole summer brings these kids with cancer and their siblings, their brothers and sisters too, who may not have the cancer, they bring them to yes. the camp for the entire summer. So now you're asking yourself a question, how can I, how can I bring in uh, over a hundred, more than a hundred kids for a summer? And if you do the math, it costs about $6,000 a kid to run this camp. So now you do the math and you yes. say, okay, well, $6,000 a kid over a hundred kids. That's, that's close to a million dollars. That's six, 700 million, six, six to $700,000 close to a million dollars to run this camp. 
but we raise yes. the money because cancer tugs at people's heartstrings. Not every cause, not every activity has that same type of draw yeah. or, or tug. You have to find what the, the, the interest of that donor is. You have to find what tugs at their heartstrings for them to support your cause, your organization, your agency, your after school club or whatever, whatever organization you're working for. Yes. Yeah. In fact, Dr. Gary, uh, I, I agree with, uh, I think, what you're saying, because you have a huge experience in this particular sector. And I'm sure uh, we also uh, experience one more angle uh, in sports, particularly with fundraising and sports. Uh, sport has a very long gestation period. Other causes may have immediate impact on lives. But sports creates maybe a champion and a national glory in three, four, five, six, or maybe eight years time. So with, with CSR in India being very new, uh, maybe four or five years, I feel that we are yet to uh, put a very good mark on the whole association of understanding that how important sport is. So that's also a, a situation where I feel I want to request your views that how does uh, going forward with sports being a long term project and there's no guarantee also. If you support 100 people in cancer uh, for chemotherapy, I'm sure 90 will come out, out of it. But if you support 100 sports young grassroots athletes, maybe only 20 will come as medalists. Then somebody will become coaches. Somebody will become, you know, maybe get a government job or a sports quota job. So how does sports get evolved as a top priority in CSR? That's good. I, I, I love your thinking. I, I go back to uh, Nelson Mandela in his speech about the power of sport. Uh, Dr. Perry, yes. uh, who preceded me as a speaker today, was talking about sport and, and about Olympism, and that's a major theme of your of your webinar. And Cooperton, Cooperton said, it's not about the winning. It's about the effort. It's about the participation. I mean, there are countries that hardly ever win a medal in the Olympics. So does that mean they're not, they're not successful, that they're not popular, that they're not worthwhile? If, if you, if you yeah. look closely about what sport should be about, it's about the effort, it's about the participation, it's about the glory of coming together, socializing, recreating, the exhilaration that you, you have, and just the fact that you're, you're participating. So if, if I'm going to Pepsi or some other company to say, I want you to support our sports program, the, it's, it's the pride in the program. It's the, the impact in the program. It's the passion in the program. It's not about the winning. It's not about winning gold medals. I mean, if, if, if I got paid on the amount of gold medals my students won, I'd be very, very poor. But if I win on the fact of how many people, how many of my students participate, ah, I'm a winner. So it's the glory of the effort, it's the participation, it's the passion, it's the connection, it's the pride, it's the impact. So you have to translate those ideals to those businesses and those corporations through the corporate social responsibility, yes. through fundraising, because it, again, it's more than money. It's more than the winning. It's about the effort. It's the pride. It's the participation. It's the effort. Remember Mandela and his speech on the power of sport, and remember Cooperton on his ideals and his definition of Olympism. Yes. Yes, Dr. Gary. Uh, thank for that uh, perspective. Uh, I think your experience really speaks volumes of uh, what you must have seen through various uh, all these years. That's so nice. I, I have one more point before we move, we move on to more Q&A. Uh, one small perspective. What do you feel about the current situation of COVID? Uh, overall, uh, you've been a sports author, you've been a sports uh, uh, you know, fundraiser, you've been a professor, you've been in various aspects altogether. What do you feel the future of sports? With regard to COVID, sensitive the, the, question. 
the the future of sport as it relates to COVID? Is that what you're asking me, Major? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, wow. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not familiar with what's going on in in India, but here in the United States, they they started. They started back very slowly this week with golf. There was a golf event, professional, uh, uh, the men's professional golf tour started back this week in Texas. Yes. First time they've competed in, I guess, what, 10 weeks or more? And they're competing without a crowd. So the, the players are playing, but there's no, there's no participants. There's no uh, customers, there's no people in the uh, in in the stands in the audience. They're talking about bringing back National Basketball Association, professional basketball, professional soccer, professional baseball, and they're they're doing it in a in a way that is so different. Um, I don't know. It's you know it's it, my my feeling is the the country needs sport again. And uh, they need their heroes to cheer for, um, but it, we're not going to have that same type of ability to go to the arena or to the stadium and sit next to other, you know, other people next to you. Uh, I've seen pictures where they'll have every other seat, every other row. Um, you know, they'll have these players quarantined in a, in a, a separate hotel. They're going to have all their games in the, our state of Florida. They don't have to travel because people are still very leery about airline travel and hotels. And But the country is opening up slowly. Business is starting to come back. Yeah. So I think that if we, in sport, if we stay optimistic and positive, that hopefully we'll, we'll see sport again in, in a way it might be a little bit different than we've seen it in the past. But, but sport will be back. I think it has a special place for many of us. And um, we just may be witnessing the sport in a different different way moving forward. But it'll be back. That's great to hear, Dr. Gary. Uh, before uh, I'll now move on to the last few minutes of Q&A, I have one question here. Uh, Anubhav, can I take the question first before you want to come in? or You can. So we'll conclude with this last question. Yeah. Yeah, there's one question by uh, uh, Ms. Pooja Galundia, uh, and the question is that how to deal with uh, uh, well, the so-called uh, disparity in sponsorship for gender sports. Uh, I think she feels that the money coming in for funding to sport, whether commercial or social, is not exactly equal. So how to deal with that? <laughs> yeah, Pooja. Yeah. Oh, boy. You, you're right. It's, it's, a, it's a shame. It, it really is a shame. We talk about sport that we should not discriminate against gender, race, religion, ethnic, education, but we, but we do. And it's unfortunate that in the United States, the men get all the money. Uh, if you look at the, we, we call it soccer, your foot, the football for, for, the, for the men and the women. The, our women's team is more popular and more successful than the men's team. However, the men's get more funding. So you tell me how fair that is. The history of tennis in our country, that the men always got more prize money than the women. There were always more sponsorships sponsoring the men than the women. We've come a long way, but we've got a, still a long way to go. And how do you change that? Pooja, you may be smarter than I am, but I think it takes time, it takes education. I think it, it just, we just have to keep, keep pushing for what's right. We, the, the women, the men, the organizations have to speak out about what's, what's right, uh, equality, diversity. We, it's just, it's, it is unequal, it is unfair, but, we recognize it as an issue and uh, we, we keep fighting for, for equality. So thank you for bringing that question up. It was outstanding. Thank you, Dr. Gary.
brilliant uh mr ashwin pogal no that's that's yeah. it in terms yeah. of question uh, but in case you have any uh, concluding concluding remarks uh, then go for it okay okay so uh we thank you dr, uh, dr. gary bunstein for a excellent session uh, on uh, transformational fundraising i think the word in itself is very clear that one has to change that a thinking and transform the whole thinking process right from the the donor to the the grantee and look at the overall association in, in utilizing the fund right from the proposal stage to the implementation stage and actually form together for a value result which is for common goal and objectives as you rightly mentioned uh, with principles of fundraising and the objective of forming a relationship which is very important in any sphere of life but especially to our topic today i'm sure the participants today will understand and apply what one has to with your feedback today we have learned a lot with the expertise and we look forward to more collaboration uh, in future uh, thank you so much once again on behalf of our team and wish you all the best take care thank you thank you very much it was a pleasure being here it was a, it was a, I, I, it was an honor is an honor to be part of your 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 team of presenters and um, thank you thank you much and hopefully we'll see you again soon thank you dr gary thank you brilliant thank you so much uh, dr bernstein uh, thank you so much uh, major ashwin pogola that was certainly uh, an extremely enlightening uh, and intellectually stimulating and thought provoking session that we had uh, we'll now move on to the final session of the day but we also have a valedictory ceremony or the closing ceremony after the final session uh, so stay tuned for the next uh, couple of hours on our one place sports networks we will not be breaking at all uh, we go non stop uh, between now until uh, the end of the valedictory session uh, so for the final session i have uh, dr surinder kumar bhandoria who will be the moderator for this session and uh, dr bhandoria is uh, the deputy director of education at sdmc new delhi in india and uh, dr bhandoria will be introducing who the speaker is and he'll also establish for you what the the topic of discussion will be dr bhandoria can you hear me clearly yeah yeah i'm hearing you and go great great dr bhandoria fantastic uh, and uh, we also have uh, juan pablo from uh, the unesco who i believe will be joining us uh, for the session as well so over to you dr bhandoria take over the reins from me Yeah, I'm audible, Anubhu. Yes, yes. Okay, yes, sir. I just introduced the uh, speaker, Dr. Catherine Carte, uh, who is the chair manager of UNESCO from Ireland. Uh, she is dealing with the physical education and sports. Thank you, Dr. Catherine Carte. Thank you, Dr. Bandoria. Pleasure to be here. Um, greetings, everybody. I have a short presentation which I'll try and share on screen now. If I just can get this up. Okay. Okay, so I hope you can see the screen. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. yes okay, please. fair enough. I actually can't see you anymore so I, all I'm seeing is my own screen in front of me so I'll keep an eye on the time. Um so I wanted to just connect Olympism sport and human rights and some of the work that's happening with UNESCO and how it connects to this agenda and indeed how some of you might like to connect with some of the work that's happening internationally um and the relevance for uh, of it I suppose to Olympism and Olympic education in the 21st century. So I guess the current work streams that we're working on in sport uh, within UNESCO are connected with the sustainable development agenda and the work that has been taking place since 2015 on advancing sport policy and related matters uh, underpinned by approaches that connect with the sustainable development agenda. And as we know, the Olympic principles are United Nations principles as was indicated by uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in 2009. Um so I guess there's a quite a lot of connection between uh, the agendas that we're working on and Olympism. So UNESCO at the moment are involved in advancing a, an action 
plan known as the Kazan Action Plan, which very much is underpinned uh, by the Sustainable Development Goals and Sustainable Development Approach. It aligns with 11 of the goals and 39 targets of the, of the SDGs. So very much part of that development agenda. And I know the Sustainable Development Goals are very significant within the Olympic movement as well. And indeed, the Olympic movement has, has been involved in advancing the Kazan Action Plan. So why now? Um, I, the, I have this image here to, to denote the idea of riding a wave. In other words, there is a momentum at the moment in the global sports movement that we really haven't seen prior to this time. And it started with those SDGs in 2015 and the sports sector aligning itself with the aspirations of those goals and what they wanted to achieve. So UNESCO launched their policy, the Kazan Action Plan in 2015, and, or sorry, 2017 in Kazan in Russia, following the World Conference of, of Ministers and Senior Officials in Sport. And from that day to now, and indeed onward towards 2030, we were working around implementing the follow-up actions of the Kazan Action Plan. It's very much being advanced in a spirit of partnership. And that's why I'm saying this riding the wave and why now. Um, the partnerships that have come together to advance sport policy agendas internationally are, are huge. There's been a, a lot of collaborative efforts from, from IOC, National Olympic Committees, UN agencies, sports bodies on the ground, academia, research sector, um, lots of different agencies both in a top-down and bottom-up approach to advance practice. Okay, so what we can see here is that, you know, the kind of connection between sport and human rights has been, it's been a, a long runway. It's been a slow mover, really, um, in terms of connecting sport and human rights and really having something very tangible and concrete uh, that connects sport, Olympism, human rights, etc. So the idea that we all share the same human rights was established in 1948 with the Universal Declaration. And then the next four treaties that you'll see here illustrated on the top of this diagram are all treaties that explicitly reference sport and physical education, physical activity, play, etc. So from 1966 with the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, there are specific articles in there that reference sport, which I'll come to later. The Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And again, there, there are explicit references to sport. Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Now, what's interesting about the Sustainable Development Agenda and indeed the Kazan Action Plan that I mentioned is they are underpinned by a human rights approach. So the rights based approach is one that really is driving the actions and initiatives in there. The Sustainable Development Agenda has as its mantra, no one left behind, starting with the most vulnerable. So really making it very important that we address the rights of all people in the work that we are doing in and around sport. Um, we just heard from the last presenter around the funding disparity. Yes, that absolutely exists. And we are aware of disparities for many other population groups as well in and through sport. So it is a real opportunity and time to look at how we can address the imbalance that we do see out there. The other significant action plan that came out since the since the Sustainable Development Goals was WHO's Global Action Plan on Physical Activity. There's a lot of overlap between these action plans in terms of how they are addressing sport. But what's really interesting, too, is a shift from 2015. UNESCO previously had charters, as you can see there in 1978, 2015, the International Charter, for example. But the switch in 2017 to having action plans that looked for measurable actions and accountability for what countries are doing, for what sports bodies are doing, has very much come to the fore and stimulated that collective action that I'm mentioning to you. And I think that has been a really positive movement. The Olympic Charter connects in very much with the goals and aspirations and actions of these three action plans that we see. And underpinning that, you have the United Nations Action Plan on Sport for Development and Peace, which is currently in the process of being um, redefined, redesigned, and it references 
the Kazan Action Plan is a key policy driver and unifying agent, agent and also the, the importance of the Global Action Plan on Physical Activity from WHO in advancing practice. So there's a lot of policy contexts there. But what's interesting is the, the intersection of them. And this is not just the intersection of the aspirations of them. It's the work that's currently being advanced to bring us forward towards what we're seeing in the, the, the aspirations of the SDGs and the number of players that are working together to advance these agendas. There's a lot of crossover between the people implementing and advancing the Global Action Plan on Physical Activity, the Kazan Action Plan, the SDGs as they relate to sport, the human rights agenda as it relates to sport, and indeed the Olympic Charter. So I think it, it's good to have a look at these things holistically in terms of how we are uh, bringing things together and advancing the agenda. Okay, so the Olympic Games and sport um, sees itself as a promoter of human rights. Uh, we see this from olympism.org, from the inclusiveness um, into specific conditions around the building of the venues, etc., and all the conditions that relate to that delivery of a Games. Um, the goal of Olympism being sport at the service of harmonious development of man. So that human dignity, peaceful society agenda is evidenced in the Charter. And we heard the UN Human Rights Chief speak of, in 2012, speak of the Olympic and Paralympic Games having enormous potential to promote awareness and understanding of human rights. So not just human rights within the Games themselves, but to, to use the, the Olympic movement, the Paralympic movement, to increase understanding of human rights more broadly into society. It was also noted at that time how little interaction there has been between human rights movement, mechanisms and institutions and the world of sport. So even though there's strong reference to human rights in many sports related areas and sport related policy, there actually has been relatively little concrete action. So I think that we're, we're still seeing a divide between the sports sector and the human rights sector or movement and vehicles as they connect with sport. And one of the key actions of Kazan Action Plan, which I mentioned to you, was to bring those two things closer together. And so shortly, I'll talk to you about some of the tools and templates that we've developed to try and help that. So again, here we see this emphasis on human rights in the fundamental principles of Olympism, um, the practice of sport being a human right and looking at practicing sport without discrimination and a spirit of friendship, solidarity, fair play, enjoyment of rights. And again, without discrimination across the areas of discrimination that are referenced there, uh, notable absence of disability from, from that uh, listing. However, it is very much uh, part of the sentiment of the spirit of Olympism, as we know. Again, uh, this is paragraph 37. So I mentioned the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. None of the goals explicitly reference sport, nor do any of the 169 targets connected with the 17 goals. But sport is listed in paragraph 37 of the Transforming Our World document. And these paragraphs carry as much weight as any of the individual goals and targets. The paragraph on sport, you can see here on the right, it says sport is an important enabler of sustainable development. We recognize the growing contribution of sport to the realization of development and peace in its promotion of tolerance and respect and the contribution it makes to the empowerment of women and young people, individuals and communities, as well as to health, education and social inclusion objectives. Now, we know that the entire Transforming Our World document is underpinned by a human rights approach and thus looking at how sport and human rights connects is very important. I mentioned earlier the World Conference of Sports Ministers. It took place, the sixth conference took place in Kazan in the Russian Federation in 2017. And the purpose was to facilitate that international collaboration, um, look at unifying the global sports sector in advancing practice, um, building mechanisms based on the SDG mantra of no one look left behind. So really focusing on starting with those most marginalized populations and looking at how policy and investment decisions can be evidence-based, rights-based and led from areas of most need. So I think this is probably one of the most significant action plans that has been laid down to advance sport on an international platform with relevance to national um, initiatives and also not just at a state level but across 
the whole um, range of people who are involved in delivering on sport from federations, national Olympic committees, grassroots organizations, NGOs, etc. Kazan Action Plan has three main policy, ac policy action areas that are listed across the top here, developing a comprehensive vision of inclusive access, maximizing the contribution of sport to sustainable development and peace, and protecting integrity. We in the UNESCO chair have been charged with leading on this inclusive policy actions of the Kazan Action Plan. So under those three main policy action areas, there are 20, um, 21 other policies. Three to five that are listed here below align with inclusion, making inclusive practice better, inclusive societies, vulnerable groups, gender, um, uh, gender equality. Um, and we are looking at those as well from an intersectional point of view. So where like girls, boys, with, uh, girls with a disability um, might be doubly marginalized or discriminated. So the follow up framework of Kazan Action Plan um, is what everybody's working on now. The, agent, the groups that I mentioned to you who are around the world working on the delivery of Kazan Action Plan are working on these five action areas. So elaborate an advocacy tool presenting evidence based argument for investment in physical education, physical activity and sport. And part of that action includes the human rights work that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Secondly, develop common indicators for measuring the contribution of physical education, physical activity and sport to prioritized SDGs and targets. So I mentioned that 10, 11 of the SDGs have been mapped to sport has been mapped to 11 of the SDGs. And quite a considerable amount of work has been undertaken under Action 1 to look at developing common indicators that can be collected at a country level in order to have internationally comparable data on how sport is contributing to the sustainable development agenda. The indicators that are developed in action two are the same indicators that we're going to use in relation to human rights reporting in action one via a different reporting mechanism, which we can come to. Um, but that re reduces the ask on countries if they are going to invest in gathering information. We don't have internationally comparable data at the moment. So if countries are being called on to gather data in relation to sport um, and inclusion and uh, the various differences that we see, then we want them to we want to maximize their investment. We don't want to have an overwhelming ask on countries in terms of investment into gathering this data, but we want to show how that data can be used for different functions in order to advance uh, sport in their country. So it's not just for international use for the sake of gathering data. It's developing a suite of data or a set of data that can be used to advance practice on a country level and help us better understand where investment should best go. Uh, the third action is to is in the field of sports integrity um, and this has been led by Council of Europe. The fourth action is in relation to a global observatory for women addressing gender disparity and access and the fifth one relates to a clearinghouse uh, connected with this overarching sports policy follow-up framework. So that is the, the kind of evidence base being collated in that clearinghouse to try and advance practice. Okay, so today I want to focus on the elements, the human rights related elements um, as delivered through those four treaties I mentioned earlier, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Each of these articles, as I referenced before, uh, explicitly reference sport, play, physical education and physical activity. They connect with the SDGs as well, as you can see on the left hand side, how the specific articles of each of those individual treaties connect with SDGs. And they connect in a range of different areas across good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, economic work, uh, decent economic uh, work and growth, industry, innovation and infrastructure, uh, reducing inequalities, delivering on sustainable cities and communities, peace, justice and strong institutions and partnerships for the goals. Um, so you can see the whole range of areas that sometimes those beyond sport don't really understand that sport touches on, such as habilitation and rehabilitation into health, into the rights of children with disabilities, 
into freedom for violence, abuse and exploitation, uh, into the areas of work and employment, non-discrimination, participation in cultural life, independent living, participation in economic and social life. So there's a whole range of areas of governmental responsibility well beyond ministries of sport that sport touches on. And following these approaches that align with human rights and that align with the sustainable agenda has enabled sports bodies, both um, ministries and national sports bodies to have discussions at government level that they haven't really had in the past. And I think that augurs well for better investment and better understanding of the, the value of sport um, in our societies. So the core values of Olympism being excellence, respect and friendship demand uh, uh, respect of human rights and realization of human rights in that regard. So it was decided to look at these uh, treaty instruments that I've referenced already and see how we can connect the sports bodies with delivering on the rights that are inherent in these conventions. The other process that's listed on the bottom here, I mentioned a universal periodic review. So this is where a country periodically has to um, report to the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights on all their human rights treaties that they have ratified. In the case of India, for example, India has ratified each of the four treaties up above and India has participated in universal periodic review process um, before now. So in that, that is a very uh, public, I think, and very high level review of a country's performance in relation to its human rights obligations. So because sport is referenced in each of those four treaties, sport, ha sport should be covered in the universal periodic review that has come from any country. We have spoken to the committees of those four treaty bodies and we've asked them when they are asking countries what to report on to ensure that they ask them to report on sport, given the amount of uh, work that is happening at the moment to facilitate better reporting on sport. There are the individual treaties that are, ref are the individual articles of the treaties that explicitly reference sport. But in addition to the main articles that reference sport, so you can see in the case of economic, social and cultural rights, it's Article 2 and 15. In the case of CEDAW, it's Article 10 and 13. But there are other articles that sport can deliver through as well that, that connect with sport. So there might be a specific article on sport and others that relate to that sport can help deliver on, like such as in education, for example, and having physical education and quality physical education. Different countries and different organizations are at different, at different places with regards to how they are addressing human rights. The fundamental thing that everyone needs to do is recognize the rights of all. Then we need to make our practice inclusive so we can be sure that we can include all people uh, in sport, physical education and physical activity. A lot of the time at the moment, this is not embedded in, say, pre-service um, undergraduate vocational courses to prepare people to work in physical education, physical activity and sport. And what we want to get to is a place where we mainstream diversity um, in sport across the board, including in the preparation of professionals to work in the sports sector through university uh, programs and, and, and research areas indeed. So yeah, I mentioned before, countries who ratify any of the conventions have to report usually every four years to the particular committee of the treaty body looking uh, of the relevant treaty. Um, and that includes India. Now, as we can see by from this res resolution, declaration on the rights and responsibility of individuals, organs of society to promote and protect universally recognized human rights. The main uh, duty is on the state. So the main duty to ensure that rights are realized lies with the state. But that does not mean the state has to do everything. The state has to look at how within their country, structures and operations, organizations are ensuring that people's rights are being realized. It also places, recognizes the right and the responsibility of individuals, groups and associations to promote respect for and foster knowledge of human rights. So that's where the Olympic Committee, for example, has a, a, a right to, a, and responsibility around this agenda as well and should be part of the state report when the sport state is being asked to report on sport. So I'm going to just quickly run through uh, some of the articles of the different treaties. Um, so as you can see, 
how heavily sport really features in these UN treaty instruments. And it's also worth noting that there are nine core treaties in the UN and four of them, the four I'm going to mention now, explicitly reference sport. So sport is actually quite highly recognized with regard to its contribution to human rights and the opportunity it present, presents to learn about human rights through sport. So in relation to disabilities, um, Article 30.5 of CRPD looks to uh, enable persons with disabilities participate on an equal, uh, equal basis with others, encourage the participation of people with disabilities in mainstream sport, um, look at the opportunities that people with disabilities have to organize, develop and participate in disability specific sport and encourage the provision of appropriate instruction, training and resources. Um, so that's to everybody who's going to be working in, in the sport arena that they would know how to include people with disabilities to ensure access to venues, to ensure that children with disabilities have access to play, recreation, etc., and to ensure access to services. So that's the main part of, of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. There is a huge population of people with disabilities, which I think sometimes people don't always appreciate. Approximately 1.5 billion people in the world have disabilities. And from, from what we know, with, I have to say, relatively low quality data, but uh, figures indicate that children with disabilities are 4.5 times less active than their peers without disabilities, which is quite shocking. And 93% of women with disabilities are inactive at levels that promote health. In general, we could say people with disabilities are three times less active than people without. So the opportunities don't appear to be there. From a human rights point of view, we've changed our perspective um, to dealing with disability from a charity position uh, through a medical model to a social model. And we're now at this kind of place where we're positioning a biopsychosocial approach and a human rights approach to how we deal with the area of disability, which is much um, more emphasis on equality, uh, you know, in, in that approach and transformative equality from a law, law point of view. So providing those access. Aside from Article 30, which is the main COPD article relative to sport, these other articles can help deliver uh, human rights through sport. So uh, women and girls, looking at women and girls, awareness raising, freedom from exploitation, mobility, health, work and employment, children, accessibility. Sport can be used as a vehicle to deliver on each of these rights. And that is very, I think that's very significant in terms of the reach of sport within that particular uh, treaty. There's the connection with the SDGs and the range of areas where CRPD and the SDGs and indeed Olympism connects and how it delivers across health, habilitation, education, the whole breadth of areas. So I think sometimes people think sport is sport. It's about fun and games and it's not about looking at living independently or accessibility or, you know, freedom from exploitation, violence and abuse. So I think here delving into these treaties at governmental level will really help those ministries, usually beyond sport, see the value of sport and hopefully increase the investment in sport. You have reference in your own national doc documentation in India around promotion of sports among people with disabilities in, indeed, and some of the organizations, Paralympic Committee, Special Olympics, etc. There's also recommendations around the private sector. So I'm sure through the National Olympic Committee, some venues that you might use are relate to the private sector, and they also have to look at what they can do to eliminate discrimination, to open up facilities and services, to provide information, to have care of the same quality to those people and to promote the employment of people with disabilities. We know when people with disabilities are employed in sport, um, it has a very uh, important and impactful effect, not just on those employees with disabilities, but actually on the whole organization. And it's a very positive effect. So CEDA, which is the Convention on the Elimina Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, states in Article 10 that men and women must be treated equally in education through access to the same curricula, examinations, etc., encouraging co-education and the same opportunity to participate actively in sports and physical education. So this is outlined in Article 10 of CEDAW, while Article 13 says states must guarantee the equal right of men and women to participate in recreational activities, sport, sports and all aspects of cultural life. 
So states must guarantee it, but it's up to everybody to who is involved in the promotion and delivery of sport to take responsibility for delivering on these rights and to report on it. Again, these other CEDA articles have relevance to sport. Article 8, participation at an international level. Article 11, unemployment. Do women have the same access to employment in and through sport? Um, Article 12, access to health as it relates to physical activity participation and indeed sport participation. And rural women, do rural women have the same access to sport opportunities um, as, as others? CEDA also connects with the SDGs through health, work and employment, rural women, education, participation in economic and social life, participation at an international level. So again, there there's good international reference. The Convention on the Rights of a Child, and I think every country in the world except the US and Somalia have ratified this particular treaty. That means they all have universal legal obligation to deliver on this. And this article says that children have the right to rest and leisure, to engage in play and recreational activities appropriate to their age, and to take part in cultural life and the arts. Other, C other CRC articles of relevance is that in and through sport, are we sure that children can have freedom from violence, injury, abuse, neglect and exploitation? Um, are we sure that children with disabilities have access? Are we sure that children, with dis ch that children can access uh, physical activity opportunities that relate to uh, delivery of health at the highest attainable standard? And are we sure that children have a right to quality education, and in this case, physical education um, and school sport opportunities that will enable them attain their rights under Article 28 and 29? There's the connection again with the SDGs. And these, as I re-emphasize, all connect with the idea of Olympism and the values that are fundamental values of Olympism. So, you know, you can see how the breadth of, of sport is, is really of relevance as you go through the areas that these co covenants and conventions address. So here, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So sport can help deliver here through work, uh, through Article 12 on health, through Article 13 and 14 on education, um, and indeed through cultural life, which includes sports and games, as you can see in Article 15. Again, there's a connection with the SDGs, various different SDGs here, good health and well-being, quality education, decent work and growth, and peace and justice. Okay, so there are the treaties. So as I mentioned, there are four treaties, and then collectively, all four treaty areas are, are also reviewed under the Universal Periodic Review process. But when a national report is being prepared in a country, whatever country, I appreciate there are people here from different countries, but we have analyzed the state reports relevant to those four treaties I mentioned. And honestly, to up, to, up to this point, they've been pretty random in terms of what they report on. And what we're aiming to do through this action of Kazan Action Plan is to have much better reporting to the human rights bodies on sport and what sport contributes to. And we believe that this will be a positive, that this will deliver positive outcomes from sport because it will really show where the gaps are and where we're doing well or where we need to do some more work. Sometimes in the preparation of the national report, a very small group of people might be involved, but it is recommended that a range of uh, ministries need to be consulted in the case of sport, sport, education, labor, urban development, health, communication, children and local government would be relevant and perspectives from sport bodies need to be sought if the state report is to tell the full story. But that aside, sport bodies, say National Olympic Committee, NGOs, civil society bodies can submit their own report. It's known as an alternative or parallel report to the committee outlining their views on whether sport is doing enough, if it's doing well. It's important to tell good stories, but it's also important to highlight areas maybe that are areas of concern at a country level, such as if there's not gender equality in provision for sport, or if there's not equality for those with disabilities, or there's not investment to enable the national sports organizations to provide effectively for those with disabilities. It would be an appropriate place to highlight that. And then um, the state is asked, well, what are they going to do to rectify the situation? So maybe it's a case that more investment is needed on gender equity or on um, even safeguarding might be a case that investment is needed in safeguarding. It might be a place to say it. Um, 
So this is the situation in relation to India and reporting. So India ratified these treaties in 1979, the first one, uh, 1992, 93, and 2007. So you can see the reporting. So November 2025 is when the next Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is due. Economic, social, and cultural rights is an overdue report there. There's a report due this year to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. That date, I imagine, because of COVID-19, has probably been pushed out from July to possibly a little bit later. So there may still be opportunities to report on in that report. Um, Okay, I'm not going to go through this, but you can see this is a sample of what India uh, included in their last report to the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. The only thing I wanted to point out with all this text is the emphasis on competitive sport. And obviously the CEDAW articles go much further beyond just competitive sport into access to sport, access to physical education, you know, from grassroots activities into governance and leadership of sports related um, organizations, etc. So this is not atypical where a lot of the country reports talk about how many medals they won or how many people went to a particular games at elite level. But we all know that the elite participation um, is a small percentage of national participation figures. So the tools that we're developing are trying to get better quality information. So India is due to undergo its second voluntary national review, that's of the SDGs, this year. Um, and there is an opportunity again to reference what India is doing to deliver on sport as it relates to the SDGs. India is currently a member of the UN Human Rights Council and you've got Miss Preeti Saran there, who is on the Committee of the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Committee. So India has got strong representation at the UN at these uh, human rights areas. So that I, I mentioned Universal Periodic Review, um, next to take place in May 2022, and um, the deadline for submission of the state report is July 2021. So between this year and next year, you could have a look across all those human rights areas and see from a sport point of view, what should you put in your report that goes forward for UPR to show the good things that are happening in sport as it aligns with um, human rights, but also areas where there's scope for improvement and maybe need for more investment on a national level in sport. So we have developed a suite of resources they're available on this website. The link will come up in a minute, but basically um, a whole range from Action 1 of Kazan Action Plan, we've developed a whole suite of tools and templates for reporting to those areas you see across the bottom. So to CRPD, CEDAW, uh, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, CRC, UPR process and SDGs. These are very, they, we created them very simply to, to make people or to enable people to understand why they should get involved in this process. What's the benefit to them? What's the use of it? And what type of information is useful for this reporting? We've done this in partnership with other people. So at the moment, the countries that have formally joined our action include Ireland, Monaco, San Marino and Brazil, actually Tunisia as well. Um, and we, we invite India and the, the government of India and indeed the Indian Olympic Association to, to officially join us in this action. There are some of the sports federations. So we have the International Olympic Committee, Paralympic Committee, Special Olympics, Deaflympics, uh, International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity, et cetera, a private sector body there, ERSA, a lot of civil society organizations and a number of international organizations over there on the left, which includes UN DESA as well. So this, these are some of the collaborators in CAP Action One. I just wanted to mention then, as the, the seminar looks also at Olympic education, the connection with some of UNESCO's tools in education. And here's one that might be of interest at a national level, which is UNESCO's Quality Physical Education Initiative. This is uh, guidelines for policymakers, and there are a whole suite of guidelines for policymakers to take to um, develop quality physical education initiatives on a country level. Um, on a practical level, Oh, sorry, Qual quality physical education then has a range of interrelated strategies to embrace 
uh, and develop inclusive and equitable curricula. And that will ultimately help deliver into sport. Once those foundations are grown early on, uh, even in preschool, into school, through the school years for participation in sport and understanding of, of quality practice and equitable practice, then those uh, people who will feed into the sports system outside of school and up into elite level and including at grassroots level will increase. Supporting the delivery of quality physical education, we have developed in the UNESCO chair a program called IPEPAS. It aligns with the charters I mentioned and even the Olympics values program. So we previously had a different title on this program. It was called EPIT, but it was part of the Olympics Olympic Values Education Program. It was embedded in that as the inclusive component. So how do you do inclusion under Olympic values? Or um, it, it, this, the resources that we had developed were being used for that. And the resources that we have developed under IPEPAS, we make available free of charge to universities and bodies who want to switch to or build in more inclusive practice into their current practice. It's a blended learning program um, so we have a huge amount of online contact content. We're available to support, uh, you know, so to support capacity building in universities and other agencies should that be needed. And you know, maybe there's expertise in your country or region that that can already provide that support. But we have the resources developed; they're free of charge, and anyone uh, we welcome anyone to use them. Here are the links to some of our resources. So the sport and human rights tools are at the top link there. And I'm sure you, the presentations will be shared by the organizers so you can have the links. Uh, we also have one called UFIT. This is for kind of the fitness sector, community level facilities um, who maybe are not particularly inclusive at, at the moment and want to become inclusive. We have a whole program around that. And we also, the link there points to the home exercise elements that we have. So we have developed a range of home exercise activities specifically for people with disabilities in time of COVID-19, but actually they're for everybody. Uh, they're kind of universally accessible, but we do have some specific guidelines for individuals with impairment and disability uh, that they might keep active during this time. So that brings me to the end of this formal part of my presentation, and I hope you do have some questions for me. Um, so I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to participate. Um, and thank you to the president of the Indian Olympic Association, Dr. Batra. Thank you to Mr. Kushwaha, chairman of the Olympic Education Committee, to Dr. Malik, the organizing secretary, and thank you to Mr. Neeraj Mehra for all his support in terms of technical support and coordination. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Catherine. It's a really insight for the goals of the UNESCO and UN especially for the para para athletes and the opportunity to be given to these disabilities uh, community and people around the world uh just why want to raise some points here because they are the they are the insight now in india also we have some sports federations which are having their own para uh, body within their uh, constitution so that's that uh, we we are also coming up in this field uh, but my point is that he in uh, although we are treated as a sports is the integral part of total education process but still when we are talk about these sports uh, you have also uh, talk about that uh, in unesco or uno uh, still sports is still behind with the others uh, goals in sustainability that's the uh, situation we are facing in India also. And we really uh, doing hard, like other Indian Olympic Association officials, especially Bhattraji and Kushwaha, they are doing wonderful job. And we are really thankful to them that such kind of session they are organizing online and giving us an opportunity to gather more knowledge about it. Thank you, Katri. Sir, thank you, Mr. Bandoria. Mr. Bandoria, did you have uh, any questions uh, for Ms. Carty? Uh, because there are the other participants, if they will allow you to ask any question, otherwise I'll just simply ask. Yes. The, 
uh, I believe uh, uh, I believe Juan Pablo may have had a question. I'll just uh, check to see if Juan Pablo is still online. I know he was there earlier on in the stream. Yeah, if he can there. hear us, uh, then uh, he might be willing to chip in with his own thoughts uh, and perhaps questions that he may have uh, for Miss Carty. If we don't hear from him, uh, then uh, Mr. Pandoria, you can carry on. In case uh, Juan Pablo does join, uh, we can uh, we can add him. Hey. JP. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Of course, I would like to begin okay. by congratulating uh, the organizers for this international webinar on Olympism and Olympic education. Uh, we are reaching the end of, of your productive two days. And um, I believe it's very important to have this discussion, particularly in this um, uh, complicated times now that we are all going through here. I am, I am here in, in New Delhi because I am based in the UNESCO office in New Delhi as head of social and human sciences. Uh, and I've been following up the situation very closely of what's going on in India. Of course, our, our portfolio on sports here is basically connected to supporting uh, civil society initiatives and with academia working on, on how best to uh, continue promoting, as Catherine was saying, the bridge between um, the right to sport, human rights, and the development agenda. Of course, sports for development is a key priority here at the national level. Uh, and I mean, in terms of uh, questions to Catherine, of course, I, I would not have any specific questions. She has uh, very clearly explained uh, the linkages between uh, the international commitments that India has uh, engaged in and the sports agenda. And certainly, I believe that uh, the ongoing uh, complex and difficult times that the pandemic of, of COVID-19 has brought is uh, and can be transformed as an opportunity uh, to, to uh, use support as a leverage to unfold um, uh, all of these commitments related to, to development, to gender equality, to human rights, and particularly to uh, taking care of the needs of, of uh, the most vulnerable, in this case, persons with disabilities. So uh, we, I have been delighted to hear her, her very uh, meaningful presentation. And uh, of course, uh, the, the UNESCO uh, Chair on Inclusive and Physical Education in, in Ireland is part of the UNESCO family, and, and we work closely together to uh, bring uh, support our member states and, and governments and, and civil society to achieve all of these development objectives. So uh, those those would be my my thoughts for now. And thank you very much for the opportunity to address the participants of this international webinar. Fantastic, JP. Appreciate you coming on. Appreciate uh, you sharing your thoughts so candidly with uh, everyone who's present here. Dr. Bhandoria, I believe you had a few uh, remarks as well. Go for it. Uh, yeah, just because I've seen one question from Abhi Beniwal. He, he is asking that is there any specific guideline for the para athletes uh, to get the coaching in this pandemic time through the online or anything else? Yeah, so some of the resources, IPC have some resources online as well to support para-athletes in continuing training, but we have through the what is on our website uh, and the link that I shared in the presentation on UFIT, there are lots of uh, para-coaches have delivered sessions on there, including some live sessions for para-athletes. And if people want specific live sessions, we can coordinate those as well um, through our UFIT uh, online resources that have been developed. Thank you, Dr. Catherine. I think it's a really wonderful presentation and we got the complete insight of the uh, UNESCO programs on sustainable development goal and particularly in the Indian, Indian scenario, which you have already covered. And now just my closing remarks, I really thankful to the organizers, especially Dr. Batra, Indian Olympic Association, Olympic Education Chairman, Prashant Kushwaha, and the backhand uh, stage players. Those who are really doing a wonderful job. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bandoria. In fact, we still have about uh, six or seven minutes left uh, in uh, this presentation, and uh, we uh, commence proceedings with the valedictory session or the closing ceremony at uh, 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time exactly. So we can still take uh, a couple of questions that are coming in from the audience. Uh, Pooja here, 
who's been uh, very active throughout the day uh, on our one play sports networks uh, is asking us uh, what's the first step to connect uh, and participate and make a difference uh, as i would love to get involved uh, so how can the the lay person get involved uh, miss carty okay so is it getting getting involved in the kazan action plan action one initiative or the disability inclusion initiative just to clarify that because i did to be fair invite people to join our kazan action plan initiative and to do that if people want to get involved in that usually be a part of one of the groupings i mentioned as opposed to individuals so if you're involved puja in a an organization um F please feel free to email me and, and I'll inform you as to how people can get involved. But there's definitely, I mean, we're driving this action um, on behalf of UNESCO and in partnership. It's what's very important that we have a, a good partnership for this. So we need and invite a representation from a very degree of stakeholders to get involved in that. If your question relates to participation, um to connect participate and make a difference on disability inclusion and i know i have a question on this area as well how can sport and disability ideally be put into practice when thinking about participation that's a question for from harman as well um i see on the side and really how this is best done we have developed a framework that you can look at it's called the universal transformational management framework and it covers all the things you need to consider if you want to make your practice inclusive so there are a number of different elements to consider but what's really important if you want to develop competence working with people with disabilities is that you work with people with disabilities so partnership with disability organizations and people with disabilities in your communities is really really important to begin to to build that competence um you can't do this theoretically in a classroom without any real contact and engagement with people with disabilities so what we do encourage universities and sports bodies to do is partner with those who you know have want to get involved in sport or who have expertise um, in including people with disabilities in sport that can work with you. And that's a very good way to kind of move the agenda forward and um, and have kind of a live partnerships happening in communities as well that make a difference to people's lives. May, may I Fantastic. add something uh, to, to yes. the Yes, thank you. I mean, uh, of course, uh, what what Catherine has said is is the the right answer on how to engage. But we we tend to get this question a lot, especially in this type of events where where we have a large audience that is uh, on the one hand specialized on the issue uh, of this webinar that it's how Olympism can contribute to sustainable development, to human rights, etc. But we may also have uh, some people that are motivated and willing to contribute. And uh, the best thing I think that we can do uh, is to, number one, get more and more involved in, in knowing about all of these um, things. You have heard today about the Sustainable Development Goals. You have heard about the Kazan Action Plan. You have heard about these international uh, conventions and, and, and commitments that uh, governments engage in and that are developed in this large international fora, just like the United Nations of UNESCO. But uh, from the civic engagement perspective and from the civil society side, it's always important to remember that these are not only for governments and not only for international organizations, but that also uh, the ownership that we can take as individuals and civil society are uh, the very things that will empower us to uh, support uh, at the community level the achievement of, of all of these noble ideas, but also uh, to embed in our own initiatives and projects these commitments that would allow us to uh, be inserted into uh, what the government is doing. So we, we should not only expect that this will be accomplished by governments alone, but particularly as one of the SDGs uh, is uh, calling the SDG 17 on partnerships. This should be something where we are all joining hands. And I think um, the uh, spirit of Olympism and sports is one of the best examples of how working together and bringing together uh, people from different sets of life uh, can achieve a lot. And finally, just a little note on the Kazan Action Plan that you have heard a lot today. I encourage you to go uh, and, and have a look 
on it. And the Kazan Action Plan is not only a global framework that uh, UNESCO is sort of responsible from, that was uh, launched and adopted by uh, ministers and authorities in charge of sports global, but we believe that the Kazan Action Plan is a living document that is actually a tool, a tool for governments and practitioners uh, to bring all of these uh, areas into reality, into the ground. And of course, uh, from Olympism to grassroots sports uh, and from competition to, to physical education, as Catherine was saying, all across the spectrum, we believe um, that uh, the Kazan Action Plan can be a powerful tool to unleash uh, the power of sports for development and particularly for sustainable development and the realization of human rights. Brilliant, JP. Very, very articulately uh, put forward. Uh, and we can uh, we can actually conclude with one final question. Uh, we have one minute left, uh, so we'll request uh, a quick answer for this one. And uh, this was Daphne who was asking us this question. I'll just quickly find it uh, and then uh, put it up on the screen. Uh, so Daphne is asking us, uh, what are the online platforms available for college or university students to be engaged in sports? Sorry, oh, the online platforms. Um, okay, so again here, is this in relation to, to the kind of human rights area? Let's let's assume that, ma'am. And in case Daphne has any follow-up questions, then she can definitely contact you via email uh, to get uh, more uh, specific information. Yeah. Okay. So for university students as well, I think um, maybe there is a, a FISU healthy campus standard that has recently been launched, actually. And we have worked with them as well to ensure that that's an inclusive standard. So if the question is for university students to engage with sport on the university campus, then that standard is very uh, well worth looking at. So FISU, the International University Association, we have worked with them to ensure that that standard aligns with the SDGs and aligns with inclusive agendas and any university campus that wants to show what they are doing around their sport offer and inclusion and the SDGs should look up and should maybe put themselves forward to get the FISU Healthy Campus Standard. Um, for university students, other than that, if, if she is referring to wanting to tap into the inclusive agenda, I would look at our IPEPAS resource. So it's by PEPAS, which is the same acronym as UNESCO's International Charter. So it's a physical education, physical activity and sport, ipepas.com. Um, and we have a lot of resources available there. Our human rights resources are also available online in the link that was in my presentation. And yeah, there, there are plenty of online resources there. Uh, and, and feel free to get in touch with me if you cannot find what you're looking for online, because there, there are actually quite a lot of resources on our own UNESCO chair website we have a repository of resources so lots of links available there too fantastic uh, Miss Carty fantastic JP and thank you so much uh, to the moderator as well Dr. Bandoria and thank you a lot uh, to all the viewers uh, who uh, asked us uh, very thought-provoking questions so this concludes the final session that we had but we have the validate valedictory session of the closing ceremony now, which will uh, kick off in just a couple of seconds. Uh, thank you so much again to the moderator, as well as to all the speakers who joined us for this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Uh, so uh, this uh, concluded uh, the final session that we had. Uh, so we're all uh, set uh, to get underway with uh, the valedictory session. Uh, you know, as uh, happy as I am to invite all of you to the valedictory session, I must say that I am uh, a bit uh, heartbroken given the fact that uh, the international webinar that we've seen over the course of the previous couple of days uh, has uh, come to an end uh, over the course of the last two days. Uh, the number of intellectually stimulating conversations that we had from morning until evening on uh, our One Play Sports platforms was staggering, was uh, through the roof. Uh, and it's definitely a bit heartbreaking that it's come to an end, but I'm pretty sure One Play Sports will continue to host many such international webinars in the future as well. Of course, none of this would have been possible without uh, your support. Uh, so appreciate uh, 
the contributions of all the viewers, uh, to all the supporters, uh, of all the fans uh, who've uh, chipped in with their comments, with their thoughts, uh, and uh, with their questions. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, we're all set to get uh, the valedictory session uh, underway. I would first like to invite uh, Mr. Prashant Kushwaha, who is the chairman of the Indian Olympic uh, Education committee to address uh, all the dignitaries, the very esteemed dignitaries who are present with us uh, for this session. Mr. Kushwa, this, the stage is yours. So you're on mute right now. If you could just unmute yourself, uh, we can see you very clearly. We can't hear you as yet. Yeah, good evening, Thank everyone. Uh, as you know, this two days seminar was started yesterday. Today also it started at 9 o'clock in the morning and right now it is going on. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Goyal. Who, who, is, who is the vice chancellor of the university from Delhi, and uh, he his university is supporting us from along. Like all his all education partner work is done by the same university. You can say with the certificates and all the help with the help of Mr. Anshul. So I am thankful to the VC sir over here and uh, all my team members who has helped me for making this event successful. Uh, major share goes to. Mr. Neeraj, he was he's a senior of mine in uh, uh, Olympic uh, in Athens. He did a course for two years there, where I was there in 2011, and he was there till 2010. All credit goes to him, and he has taken done a, uh, done a tremendous job for doing this event successful. I would also like to welcome uh, Mr. Mohit again. He's from One Place Sports, who has taken care of all the process which has been going on you can see the live the visual the the things and everything what you can see uh, approximately more than two million people have attended this i i thank mr mohit and the one play team that they have done a great job and moving this thing properly in process of what we are looking the processes right now as you know the event has been started mr uh, kiran riju minister for sports has inaugurated it our team was working from last one month on the process. We have taken three, four points, which minister has admitted and said it will be started very soon. Number one, Indian Olympic Museum will be starting very soon to build up. Number two, the education HRD scheme will be added with the, uh, the Olympic education part. And number three, curriculum for the sports and the Olympic education will be added in this school. And these were our three demands which were taken care by him and he announced at the very same day. This is a great success for our event. And I am thankful to Mr. Anshul Bhagri as well, who has uh, who has helped us in moving this system and process to a way it is. And last but not the least, I would uh, like to thank especially President of Indian Olympic Association, Mr. Narendra Batra, who has given us chance to uh, to work for this very important process of uh, Olympic education and my committee, obviously, Kamlesh ji, Sunil ji, uh, Prajapati ji, and all the team members who are in my committee from the Olympic. Act. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kushwaha. I think uh, you summed it up uh, beautifully. I think uh, over the course of the last two days, uh, in uh, all the sessions, uh, the amount of practical philosophy that has been shared uh, by all the speakers and the moderators has been exceptional. Uh, you know, there's a difference between normal philosophy and practical philosophy. Practical philosophy is not idealistic, uh, whereas normal philosophy sometimes can be idealistic uh, and can be easier said than done. Uh, so a lot of the steps, a lot of the, the proposals that were put forth uh, were certainly extremely practical, and I'm pretty sure they will be implemented uh, over the course of the short, medium, as well as long term. Uh, I would now like to invite... Uh, the very esteemed chief guest, uh, Professor Ramesh K. Goel, uh, that was introduced by uh, Mr. Prashant Kushwaha. He's the vice chancellor of the Delhi Pharmaceutical Sciences and Research University. Sir, the stage is yours. Uh, and uh, I would love for you to uh, address uh, the other dignitaries who are present right now.
Hello, should I start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can start, sir. Okay. Uh, at the outset, I would like to congratulate the Indian Olympic Association. My compliments and congratulations to Mr. Prashant Kushwaha, the chairman of this association, and Mr. Narendra Kumar Bhatra, the president of Indian Olympic Association. Along with that, yes, I can see Mr. Mohit Lalwani and uh, others. I have been uh, seeing this program. Of course, I could not attend regularly because of this whole uh, thing, but it is, it is close to my heart. This uh, Academy of Sports Sciences and Research Management, which is being uh, run by our university through the Mr. Anshul Bagai, who is taking so much pain to see that sports education takes leaps and bounds in our country. Well, I would like to first tell what and how our university is involved and then I will come to that how it can be done. See, ours is the first pharmacy university in the country. And uh, if you see the world, there are only two more in China and that's it. And uh, others are there as the uh, the institutes of excellence in pharmacy. But then you may be wondering that what this sports university has to do with it. Yes, the first thing when anybody thinks about the pharmacy is drugs, but we don't deal, we, it is not for that. The drugs or the doping, we are, it is not for that. Yes, it can be one component, nothing beyond that. But Pharmacy overall is relating to the overall health. So it includes on one side the appropriate awareness about the dopes and drugs, but at the same time, very important is nutraceuticals, the sports, food, the diet. That is one of the other uh, important part of this. And we are into the some of the research projects which can make us aware and even the athletes aware about it. But the third important component is the digitalization, sports digitalization. And as we can see now, how digitalization is becoming important, especially in the COVID era. The what has happened that things are going online. And then of course, we are talking only having the online classes or online education or online exam. But here, with respect to sports, like what we could gather this event, which you have, I must compliment for that one month hard work. I can see that with the from the list of the speakers which are there, the type of topics, what the coverage which you had. But very important is suppose if was it was to be held offline, I think you would have needed a six months time to have this type of thing. And I, I mean, uh, this is what is the the benefit of the webinars. But at the same time, we have to learn. We have to go a little faster in that. When it comes to sports digitalization in our university under the directorship of Mr. Anshul, it's an education program. See, first thing is that sports as the science is not there, not very popular in our country like this. But I'm seeing in various countries, it is very popular. What we are having sports education institution, we, of late, we have come out with various universities of sports. Of late, the educational institutions are coming out, but they are meant like a preparing the coaches or trainees or like that. But sports as a science, wherein we think of the exercise, how to assess sports assessment first. Then for the athlete, 
to maintain his abilities. Maintain his abilities not by just few instructions one to one or in a group, but through these scientifically validated equipments to have a talent such talent like India. We I, I feel that we are full of the talent, but with respect to sports, it has to be searched. And that motive, that again a mission has been done by Mr. Vishal, wherein the Kendra Vidyalas, and they really came forward in a, a large number, getting their teachers trained to see that how they teach the sports on one side to the students, but at the same time, how they assess, how they assess the students how they try to find out how the things are going on and who will be fit for which particular sports. So all these things are taken into consideration. So this is the education related, uh, I mean, the activities which we are, we have already initiated. We have not only this, the undergraduate program, we are going to have even the postgraduate program in sports sciences. But at the same time, some of the certificate courses, which are under the world class skill center of Delhi government, that also we are having two sets of such programs. And we want to expand further into it. Of course, when we say sports pharmacy, it may be sports medicine also. But very important is how to move further into it so that, yes, I am very much excited to learn in the last two days that yes, this sports Olympics, Olympism, and there is no certificate course, something like that, which we, at least in our play university, we are not having, and I have not come across such thing. So certainly we will be very, very happy to participate in this. I, I have, I must say that this is something which is exciting to me that yes, we can come for we can design a good curriculum. And as I have learned, even the government is, is uh, striving hard to have sports university also separate. So, and they have asked me to give my inputs. Certainly, this is a welcome step. And slowly, as we are seeing, the culture of these sports and the culture of understanding the real technical aspects of the sports, to understand the it's a huge market. If you see even like economies are going down, but I'm sure the economy of related to sports will not be that bad. It is affected for the time being, but maybe it will be seeing a different light now. So all these things will come. And I am sure that uh, uh, the Acad the Indian Olympic Association will tie up with us. Mr. Ansel is already there, and we will definitely be uh, supporting for the certificate courses or for the specialized courses. And we'll see to it that we really make the sports culture a little different. And I'm very happy that I was listening a little bit out from the UNESCO. So all these things are certainly all the welcome steps. My compliments once again to all, my compliments to organizers, thanks to all the speakers who have given such a wonderful lectures and they have uh, done so well in uh, making and uh, the large number of participants have been benefited by such program. So with these words and we are most welcome to our university and let us see how we can develop. Thank you very much for inviting me and giving me a chance uh, to speak a few words. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gold. It was certainly our honor and privilege uh, and pleasure to have you on our networks. And thank you so much for inviting us uh, to the university which, uh, with such open arms. Uh, I would now like to call upon stage uh, Mr. Lo Mohit Lalwani, who is uh, the founder and CEO of uh, One Play Sports. One Play Sports, of course, is the platform that has been broadcasting this uh, international webinar over the course uh, of the last couple of days. We're also the fastest growing emerging sports company focusing on grassroots and community level sports development uh, in India, Singapore, Southeast Asia. And soon uh, we will be conquering the rest of the world as well. Uh, Mohit, uh, it's uh, great to have you. Uh, of course, a big thank you to all the viewers who've been watching us on One Play Sports. Just a friendly reminder before I hand it over to Mohit uh, to subscribe to the platform if you haven't already done so, such that you can actually keep up to date with uh, live sports content as well as VOD content uh, coming to your platform, your mobile, your PC, your your uh, laptop, all year round. Uh, Mohit, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you, Anubhav. Uh, first and foremost, let me thank absolutely everybody who's been a part of this uh, for allowing One Play Sports into your homes, into your lives, and allowing this to happen the you know the indian olympic association dr batra right from the first day i met him you know he was uh, so open to what we were trying to do uh, prashant uh, kushwa has been uh, you know such a support for us during this time we work and live in some very very dramatic times right now covid-19 has changed the way we function the way we uh, deliver content the way we think and you know i think professor goel mentioned that right at the beginning of uh, you know his closing remarks one play sports began uh, you know it's just 15 months ago but we've grown to become by far the leading community sport platform uh, in asia and i think a lot has to do with our philosophy with where we want to be and why we exist and we exist because like like the sport of olympism we too have a philosophy which is all encompassing which is non-discriminatory to what, where uh, sports education should be. Uh, we believe that, you know, at every level, every sport, every community, every athlete needs to be, uh, you know, needs to be showcased. We need to build communities. We need to build friendships. We need to build strong bonds. At the end of the day, uh, you know, education in sports goes beyond just uh, delivering winners on the field. It's, it's about leadership. It's about discipline. It's about friendship. It's about fair play. And when you put all of that together, you get what One Play Sports has always uh, been a part of. We create, you know, we create heroes. And our and our ability to create heroes, like I said, goes down beyond the gold medals. It goes way into a human value chain and i think that's the one place sports has played such an important role in in um, in the development of sport in asia over the last 15 months we've been a part uh, you know uh, professor gold talked about the digitalization and of course covid 19 has accelerated that uh, but in 2000 uh, in 2019 in the last 15 months we've broadcasted over 1,000 live sports events, including some of the sea games, which were not, which were not being broadcast. Uh, and, you know, we took this globally. We believe in net neutrality, so we make sure that, uh, we make sure that uh, uh, everybody has access to our content. Uh, we believe in, uh, you know, sports that, uh, we believe in sports that, uh, go down absolutely to every level of community. Women's sports. We want to make sure that there's gender uh, gender equality, special needs. You know, we work with special needs sports, and as a business, not only have we subsidized so many community sports over the last one and a half years, but with special needs sports, we've actually always done it at our cost because we believe these are the uh, true heroes of uh, of the sporting world. They overcome such odds to be where they are. I, uh, you know, overheard, uh, uh, you know, Prashant talk about the museum. I think that's so important. I think that's going to be such an interesting destination to build, you know, to build an ethos towards uh, the history that's brought us towards where we should be as a nation. You know, in Singapore, we work very closely with the Ministry of Education and sports is so embedded into their curriculum. So I'm really excited uh, to know that that's going to happen in India as well, because I think that's really 
the future of our country and it's the future of where our leaders will come from because um, er, you know everybody knows when you when you play sport uh, you learn what it's like to be a team player you learn what it's like to be a leader you know there's been so many interesting uh, notions ideas and uh, so many thought provoking uh, opportunities that I've heard in the last two days. Certainly things that One Play Sports will take back and hopefully work closely uh, with uh, you know, the governments across uh, and the nations across, across the region to try and ensure that we can do whatever we can to bring sport to life, to ensure that we give every, every uh, underrepresented community the opportunity to shine, to be showcased, um, and at the end of the day, create heroes. You know, again, to end, I th I'd like to say that, you know, Professor uh, Goel talked about something so important, something we've realized during COVID-19, that the, the, the question of sport goes so way beyond just what's going on on the field. You know, today we are looking at health, nutrition, uh, performance goes into sleep, it goes into science, it goes into... Uh, nutrition. There are so many aspects that uh, have have changed the way I believe we are going to think uh, over the next, uh, uh, well, not just the next 15 or 16 months, but I think for the rest of our lives, because we are living in an absolutely unprecedented situation. Uh, you know, with that, I'd like to continue to extend the support that One Play Sports has given the Indian Olympic Association. We welcome all the support that we've received from the Indian Olympic Association, from uh, uh, from Prashant Kushwaha and his team, uh, from all of you who have been a part of this. And at my end, I can assure you that our commitment to the delivery of sports heroes, building communities through content, through media, through the digitalization process will continue and you have our continued support for this. Thank you so much for allowing us into your homes. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mohit, uh, for that uh, empowering uh, speech that you had. Uh, it certainly sheds light on everything that One Play Sports has been doing to reach every nook and corner of not just Southeast Asia, but every nook and corner of the world. Uh, I would now like to enjoy the privilege of uh, inviting Mr. Anshul Bagai, who's uh, the director of the Academy of Sports Science Research and Management. Uh, Mr. Bagai, uh, would love to invite you to the front stage. I see you're there. Uh, please uh, feel free to... Uh, Please feel free to address the, the dignitaries who are present here. Hi, Anubhav. Uh, respected dignitaries, it, it's been an honor and a privilege to be part of a program like this. And uh, we've had such an incredible experience with uh, the Olympic team, the new committee which has been uh, formed under the um, uh, leadership of Prashant. They've done an incredible job. We've interacted uh, in the last... A uh, few days with Neeraj and working closely with Neeraj and their team. And we have learned during this process a lot uh, into how the broadcasting business works and how we've got people together for webinars. We have, in fact, at Academy for Sports Science Research and Management, we have done a number of webinars related to sports education. Our program started three years back <clears throat> when we collaborated and formulated this academy, which is into creating a sports science program we are one of its first kinds institute in the country which gives a bsc sports science program this year we are also launching uh, thanks to our vice chancellor thanks to the board of governors we are also launching masters in sports science and also would be launching phd programs our our objective being associated to this program is to be able to pick up the best practices which are followed at the uh, olympic uh, olympic level and which is being brought through this committee of Indian Olympic Committee and other uh, committees for education purposes in our country, pick up the be best practices and also imbibe them uh, with our practices which we are following, the curriculum which we have created. We have been working very closely uh, within the university in the last three months to digitalize everything. In the, in the last three months, we've gone through the process of um, uh, distributing our education program through online practices 
uh, creating content so that all our students could receive the content online and as a policy from our vice chancellor uh, of putting all information for the whole university uh, on our digital platform is under process where all the activities all the processes would be done on a digital way we we want to we want to pick up the best practices which are followed internationally and associate with our university or with our institute and hopefully along with the partnership we can uh, propose to in indian olympic association we might be able to deliver this program to thousands of people across the country which would help them reach the final goal of excelling in sports and i think all the participants in this program are closely associated with sports and believe that sports could be a way of life in our country because currently sports is only an infancy stage the last few years where ipl picked up and so many leagues picked up it has actually fueled the imagination of people and i believe with this kind of a program happening and picking up across the country with education institutes with our honorable minister kiran rijiju uh, so he said that we are working closely with hrd ministry then the commissioner kendra vidyalaya mr santosh mal sahab also said that kendra vidyalaya is also implementing a lot of best practices we have in fact had the fortune of working with kendra vidyalaya training of uh, training of trainers of their physical educators as well as primary school teachers for um, uh, learning through physical activities and modified games so we are trying to innovate ourselves bring in better practices better methodologies and i hope this will lead towards more sports activation in the country and sports not just being a extracurricular but being a mainstream subject so people excel and put their uh, heart into developing themselves in a uh, sports professional thank you all. thanks a lot prashant for giving us this opportunity and thank you all the other dignitaries who have been on the stage and helping us and giving us a lot of content and a lot of viewers have been seeing that content we have been part of the process at the back end where a lot of registrations have taken place and uh, it's been unprecedented amount of more than 15000 registration which came over a period of 3 or 4 days which was mind boggling a day before we saw 5000 in the evening and the next morning we were seeing 15000 plus numbers going and now we are closely working with ioa so that all the participants re receive their certificates and they whatever they have gone through the program they can validate that program thank you prashant ji thank you sir thank you mohit ji uh, thank you everybody on the platform brilliant thank you thank you so much uh, mr bagai we of course had you on wednesday this was uh, the eve of the international webinar we had uh, a live session on a one play sports platforms which was a teaser or a trailer leading up to the actual webinar and uh, all of your thoughts uh, on that day were supremely intellectually stimulating and uh, all your thoughts today were extremely beneficial for the entire sports fraternity as well uh, next uh, i would like to call up on stage uh, mr richard ku and i'll give a very quick introduction of mr richard ku after which uh, i'll uh, keep the stage open for him uh, so mr richard ku is the current president of the international olympic academy participants association and uh, that's a role that he has held since 2015 he lives in toronto canada and has a masters degree in urban planning uh, where his thesis was on sustainability of the toronto 2008 uh, olympic bid uh, mr ku how are you i'm good how are you to have you on a one place sports network We're doing well, Mr. Ku. Go on. Thanks. Thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Mr. Jane had mentioned, my name is Richard Ku, and I am the president of the International Olympic Academy Participants Association. Uh, IOAPA represents over 1,100 alumni worldwide who have attended an official session of the International Olympic Academy in Olympia, Greece. Our aim is to foster an international and multicultural fellowship of past participants. providing tools and resources to facilitate olympic education and support olympism worldwide now uh, on the occasion of this valedictory ceremony for the international webinar on olympism and olympic education in the 21st century uh, i want to take this opportunity to congratulate the indian olympic association and the organizers for successfully hosting this event including dr narendra drov batra the president of the indian olympic association Mr. Prashant Kushwaha, the chair of the Committee on Olympic Education, 
and, uh, and Dr. Rakesh Malik, organizing secretary of this webinar and member of the Indian Olympic Education Committee. I might note also that Mr. Kushwaha and Dr. Malik are both members of IOAPA uh, and are alumni of the International Olympic Academy. And it's great to see uh, how your experiences at the IOA have uh, translated into uh, your work uh, with Olympic education in India and around the world. So thank you so much for, uh, for your efforts. Uh, IOAPA is proud to support initiatives that promote Olympic values through educational uh, supports, be it in schools, the workplace, Olympic academies, or through innovative, uh, web sorry, innovative webinars such as the one being produced today. IOAPA is deeply invested in assisting countries in the sharing of best practices to communicate these Olympic values to people around the world. Uh, we are now in the second year, for example, of an association with the Canadian Olympic Committee to share knowledge and expertise from their Olympic schools programs to other jurisdictions interested in learning about this educative model. And we're looking to expand our assistance to other organizations looking for opportunities to share their knowledge and expertise in Olympic education. So if you're all interested in uh, the work that we're doing and uh, how we can assist in uh, propagating and disseminating the work that you're doing, please let us know. Uh, I'd like to conclude right now by thanking the organizers for inviting our organization to this event and look forward to working with our IWAPA India country chapter, including uh, Mr. Niraj Mehra, the research coordinator at IWAPA, and the education committee of the Indian Olympic uh, Committee for future projects such as this. So once again, congratulations, uh, stay safe and be kind to one another. Thank you very much. If he could just unmute himself, uh, Mr. Ansen Sliga, who's joining us uh, from the Virgin Islands, uh, and he's the vice president of the Virgin Islands Olympic Committee and is also the founding member of the Virgin Islands Olympic Academy and the National Academy of Doping Organization based uh, in uh, the Virgin Islands. Ansen, uh, I hope you're doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well, and thank you for the invitation. It's nice to see everyone here, and it's amazing what the Indian... Uh, Olympic Academy is doing by putting on this session. I think it's rewarding to everyone involved. I've been watching some of the sessions over the last two days and I just wanna say congratulations on everything you guys have accomplished. In the Virgin Islands, we're a little different than a lot of these big countries with these big budgets and administration that are able to put on these big projects. And so we focus on once a month a year during the Olympic month, we call it, and we do about 20 activities involving different sports organizations within the community. Ongoing in the Olympic Academy, we have a radio show that we produce. We produce uh, weekly, and we try to tackle different things that are happening in our community, dealing with sport and the education of sport and the participation of sport. And so I just want to say thanks for the invitation, and I look forward to listening to everyone else. Thank you so much, uh, Anson. Uh, next up, uh, we have uh, Juan Pablo Ramirez, uh, who is affiliated with the UNESCO, and he was uh, involved with us uh, as a participant in the previous session that we had, of course, had uh, very, very uh, good and solid insights uh, to share. And uh, a quick introduction. So Juan Pablo Ramirez Miranda is the head of social and human sciences at the UNESCO New Delhi cluster office for Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. During his early career, Juan Pablo worked as a psychologist in research and education in Mexico, Argentina, and France, focusing on the development uh, of innovative programs on emotional intelligence for children and adolescents. After joining UNESCO in 2012, Juan Pablo has been posted in Paris, uh, the Hanoi office in Vietnam, and the San Jose office uh, in Costa Rica. Within UNESCO, he has worked uh, in the education sector on education for sustainable development and global citizenship, as well as on social and human sciences sector in the field. The current focus of his program in South Asia is youth, sports, gender equality, and social inclusion. Juan Pablo holds a master's degree in uh, behavioral economics from the Paris uh, Descartes University in Paris uh, and a master's in education 
from Paris 8 University, both in France, uh, as well as a bachelor's degree in psychology with a specialization in philosophy from uh, Universidad uh, Ibero Americana, Mexico, and is fluent in Spanish, English, French, uh, and Italian. So, certainly a very, very multilinguistic uh, person. Juan Pablo, the stage is yours. Uh, go for it, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anuva, for this uh, very nice introduction. I mean, I am the one who is humbled and delighted to be here and to be surrounded by all of these impressive practitioners that you have put together uh, for the past uh, two and so days. Uh, and my intervention has to begin by that, by congratulating uh, the Indian Olympic Education Committee and the Indian Olympic Association for this extremely successful uh, international webinar on Olympism and Olympic education in the 21st century. We are still all together moving forward to see how to adjust to this 21st century. And I think that uh, Olympic education and in general physical education still need to make steps towards um, uh, unleashing their power for, for, for this 21st century. And the current situation for sure uh, gives us a uh, big opportunity to rethink all of these things. Right now, uh, here in India, we are going through through uh, maybe the peak of the pandemic or something. Globally, we have seen this coronavirus pandemic uh, change our, our lives, no? for our daily lives and, and everything that we are seeing. But uh, it's still very early to really integrate into us the impact of how this will have a, a socioeconomic effect in, in every society, in every community, in every country. The United Nations Development Program has already uh, started to see that for the first time since we started measuring what we call the Human Development Index, there will be a regression. And uh, we already, uh, we were talking about earlier about the Sustainable Development Goals, that it's like the uh, largest agenda in the history of humankind to achieve sustainable development and peace. And we were on a way forward and we are already starting to see that there will be uh, some step backs, some steps back in terms of sustainable development and uh, certainly peace as a result of this crisis. So uh, right now, one of the key focus uh, as we go through this uh, health emergency is, of course, health. Governments, uh, people, societies are all thinking about health. And that is one of the key reasons why uh, Olympism and, and in general sports can have a very important uh, spotlight right now because the contribution for health and mental health of sports has to come to the forefront and has to be one of the key concerns uh, for, for all of our societies. If we have been uh, all across the board healthier in many senses, this pandemic has, uh, would have a different type of impact on us. So I think uh, this is one of the key messages that I would like to bring today, that as we will move forward and the focus will continue to be in sports, we have the opportunity to uh, rely on sports as a tool to contribute to address all of these issues related to uh, sustainable development, to peace, and to the um, achievement of, of the development objectives uh, in our communities, in our societies, and uh, 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 in our countries. And the second thing that I would like to, uh, to bring forward is a, a very important message that was included actually in, in, in the yearly message of our UNESCO Director General, Odrea Zule, for International Day of Sports for Development and Peace that is celebrated uh, every year. And she said something that, that I, I um, take the liberty to quote, that we must keep physically active because exercise is essential to good health and to physical and mental well-being. And uh, this, is, this is something very important to consider right now. And uh, the key word in that message is essential. As we go through lockdowns and, and, and through quarantines uh, for the pandemic, 
the focus has been on what is essential and what is not. And I think it is very important that we all join hands advocating for how essential sports are, again, for physical, but also for mental well-being. So um, that is something um, that, uh, as UNESCO, we are uh, promoting very strongly. And finally, as the third point for this intervention that I am extremely humbled and delighted to make in the valedictory session of, of closing this, this international webinar, is uh, on the values of sports. My, my colleague has uh, made a specific focus on, on Olympic values, but in general, I would like to uh, recall that the values of sports that are usually solidarity, inclusion, fairness, sharing, pushing one's limits, disciplines, these values, we see that they are extremely well aligned with the values that we have needed to, to go through this crisis. Right now, we are having to stay at home. We are having to um, uh, respect social distancing and other type of, of issues. And certainly solidarity, inclusion, discipline, fairness, sharing, pushing our own limits, those values that are deeply connected to sports and physical activity are the ones that we need right now to go through this crisis. So uh, another uh, big reminder of how important it is to promote the values of sports. Uh, and finally, uh, just uh, recalling that, that it is uh, extremely important to remember uh, those that are uh, probably left behind at this time and, and going forward. Uh, we need to remember that, that sports is a, it's not only a tool for development, but also a tool for social inclusion and uh, persons with disabilities and, and um, the incorporating gender equality into, into the equation is extremely important, particularly here in India. We need to keep an eye on uh, making girls and women play and making uh, girl, uh, girls and women practice sports as a tool for their empowerment and for uh, also fighting uh, gender-based violence. So uh, with that, I, I will thank you all again for sharing all of these uh, insights. And uh, on behalf of UNESCO, again, congratulate you on this successful uh, international webinar. And thank you for uh, your invitation to be here and to share my thoughts with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, JP. Appreciate all your insights. Uh, I think you summed up everything beautifully when you talked about the, the values of sports. I think you explained everything with uh, so much simplicity, yet yet with so much profundity. Uh, so appreciate you summing up uh, all the values and the philosophy of sports and Olympism that we've been talking about uh, over the course of the last two days uh, on uh, our One Play Sports uh, Networks. Uh, up next, uh, we have uh, Mr. Hoshiar Singh, uh, who has joined us. Uh, he's currently in the backstage waiting very patiently. So I'll just very quickly bring him to the front stage. Uh, and Mr. Hoshiar Singh is uh, the joint director of uh, the government uh, of Haryana. Mr. Singh, it's a pleasure. It's an absolute privilege having you on a One Play Sports Network. So uh, would love for you to take the stage and uh, share with us uh, your insights and whatever you have uh, for us. Welcome all of the dignitaries. Uh, uh, myself, Hoshiar Singh, Joint Director, Administration, uh, Department of Sports and Youth Affairs, Haryana. Haryana is a uh, leading state in India whose players won in international sports events like Olympics and World Championships. In return, the state provides its sports persons a lot of facilities which motivates which motivates other persons and youths to be a part of sports world. Haryana gives its players a lot of infrastructure facilities which motivates other persons and youths to be a part of sports world. Haryana gives its Olympic medal winners 6 crore, 4 crore, and 3 crores as a cash award for winning gold, silver, and bronze medals, respectively, for the country in Olympics. 
Haryana has many sports centers which enables its players to excel in their event or game. In the time of in the time of this pandemic, our athletes and are now doing well in their fields or in stadiums or sports complexes. As per the orders or SOPs issued by the government. In our state sports, uh, in, uh, in our state, at sports infrastructure is available for our athletes. Haryanvi culture, geographical conditions and enthusiasm of sports persons make that Haryana state provide group a, B, C services to its sports persons as per their sports achievement in various national and international events. Our state also make a provision of reservation of 3% for sports persons in group A, B and C services and 10% reservation in group D for winning medal in national or international events and also motivates our youth to seek a career in younger athletes in sports nurseries allotted to various educational institutions. Due to above facilities, Haryana wins almost 33% of total medals of India in Olympics. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hoshiar Singh. Thank you so much for talking about all the steps that uh, the government of Haryana is, has taken in uh, promoting sports in the state, uh, as well as uh, setting an example for the other states in India to follow. I have uh, Dr. Rakesh Malik now. And uh, I'll just quickly add him uh, to the front stage. Uh, and Dr. Rakesh Malik uh, is the Deputy Director of Physical Education and Sports at Punjab University in uh, Chandigarh. He's also the winner of the Maulana Abul Kalam Azad Trophy in 2019, winner of the first Kelo India University Games uh, in 2020, and uh, is also an independent observer with uh, NADA India which of course uh, is the, the anti-doping agency and is the member of uh, IOA Olympic Education and uh, the others Academic Matters uh, Committee. Uh, Dr. Malik, uh, it's a pleasure to join you, uh, to have you on our networks again. I think you were, you were there early on in the day. So the stage is set for you to uh, deliver your address uh, to the other dignitaries who are present currently with us. Thank you, Anwar. Thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful introduction regarding me. Uh, basically, I have been called for the word of thanks ceremony. So on behalf of our IOA Olympic Education and other Academic Matters Committee, as well as on my personal behalf, first of all, I am thankful to all the honorable member of the Olympism philosophy, philosophy and family. As our previous previous speakers told about that Olympians or Olympism philosophy is basically related to the persons who are directly or indirectly promoting the Olympic education. So on behalf of my personal behalf, I'm thankful to each and everyone, those who has participated in this two days international webinar on Olympic education. Uh, regarding before proceeding my word of thanks, uh, first of all, I would like to inform the August gathering regarding the statement of uh, de coveting what he says regarding the Olympic education, what, why he has requested to proceed with Olympic education. In his one of his statements, he said that Olympism represents only a part of my enterprises, about half only, but my pedagogic symphony thus consists of a part which has been completed and another which has not been completed at all. It means we all are here on the remaining aspect of this philosophy that is Olympic education. So uh, with him, there are so many others, uh, Olympics, uh, the, the persons belong from the Olympic families were involved 
for promoting the Olympic education. I would like to name those also, uh, like Carl Team and Kent. Basically, these are the persons who are the backbone regarding the formation of International Olympic Academy, which is the brainchild of brain dead period in combat. So proceeding further, first of all, I would like to thank our Honorable Minister, Shri Kiran Rejoji, who was with us as a chief guest mm -hmm. of this uh, international webinar. And he praised a lot regarding the development taking place by the International Olympic Academy and their International Olympic Education and other Academy Metric Committee under the able guidance of Prashant Khushwaji. With them, on the first day, I would ask thanks to our honorable guest of honor, honor president of Indian Olympic Association, Sri Narendra Dhruv Bhattraji, who also blessed us during the opening ceremony. I am also thankful to Shri Santosh Kumar Bal, IES Commissioner, Kendriya Vidyalaya Sangatan, those who are really promoting the Olympic education and Olympic movement from the core of heart. And I am also extending my thanks to Shri uh, Professor A. Arunangam C., uh, the President of Indian Association of Sports Medicine. I am also really sincere thanks to Dr. Richard Young, the Vice President of Transition Path, Transition Path and various other dignitaries, those who are present on the, uh, the opening ceremony of this, uh, this international webinar. I'm also extending my sincere gratitude to all the speakers, those who are, those who are with us, and uh, enlighten the August gathering on the various, uh, various aspects of the Olympic education. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Stephen Bessing, who has enlightened us regarding the Olympic education and its academic factories, the Olympic Study Centers, uh, Center of Germany, Sports University. He was uh, very much moderated by Dr. Rakesh Gupta, who is the chairman of Athletics Paralympic Olympic Committee. I am also thankful to him, sir. Uh, I also thankful to Ms. Vita Bellista, who spoke on the Olympic values, education, and opportunity that cannot be missed. And she was introduced by our uh, very young moderator, Shalini Bej, who She is the founder and director of Sculpting Mentors. After that, there is another session in which Dr. Armand Richard, who was enlightened us regarding the Olympic, Olympic, Olympic affairs and the Paralympic education with the France is taking up on the way to Paris 2020. He was moderated by Dr. Bhisham, who was very close to our Olympic education motto. He is the Olympic the founder and president of Olympic education Champal. Chapal. After that, Dr. Ulrich Roshan enlightened us regarding the bonds and Olympians, always an Olympian. Lesson learned from the Olympic medalist. It's really a very great opportunity to learn, to hear him. He was moderated by Dr. Suman Sham, the uh, CEO of Sportnex Health Tech Private Limited India. And after that, Dr. Kostinian Ellis, uh, the, the director of International Olympic Truth Center, Chris, uh, who, who spoke on the, the relevance of Olympic truths at the present scenario. He was moderated by Dr. Ram Nivas. He is the founder of Olympic Society in Chandigarh. After that, Dr. Alexis, the founder and the president of Olympism for Humanity Alliances, he spoke upon the, upon the humanity restoration gains, championships of change in the 21st century. She was moderated by uh, Dr. Neeru Malik, the fellow of Punjab University as well as Dean of Design and Fine Arts. And after that, uh, the, the, the last presenting by the Professor Pere Leg, the President of the European Association of Traditional Games. Uh, he is a Professor and Head Research National Institute of Physics and Catalonia University of Late Spain. He was moderated by Mr. M. S. Chauhan, Deputy Commissioner, KBS Chindigar. He very widely spoke about the traditional games and talk about the think globally and act locally and encouraging the local culture through sports and traditional games for the promotion of Olympic values and Olympic education. Mm -hmm. the, the first session is really very elaborative, very encouraging, very enhancing. On the second day, the session was started uh, at 9 a.m. I also thankful to all the speakers who spoke today. Uh, Professor Hishadi Shanada, who spoke upon the education exchange and program for Beyond Tokyo 2020. He, she, he was moderated by Dr. Anju Padyal, 
who is a director of academic advisor she is the academic advisor society for sports and their fitness development and the, uh, another program was uh, enlightened us by the by ofra from israel she talk about how to involve matters in sports activity and spread the value of olympism among children she said that more than 10000 women are actively participating in the mamanet the games which is indirectly spreading olympic olympic value and olympism among the society it was she was moderated by dr gautam mukherjee who is the chief executive of spotify uh, after that dr jim parry after great uh, even having a problem of health she, she has accepted our invitation and presented our the thoughts regarding the concept of sports in olympism he was moderated by dr raghveer singh man and after that miss ada jeffrey from pakistan she has very well explained about the olympism and digital integration for olympic education into the digital training she was moderated by one of our colleague dr kiran sidhu from sydney she is a, she was an international basketball player and uh, and and a professor in and was and was a professor at the university of delhi uh, and the other two speakers janefri and uh, his colleague spoke about the the power of uh, inclusion through sports and she and his colleague was moderated by dr isha joshi associate professor at rajiv gandhi college of physiotherapy and uh, after that yeah another very renowned speaker and to whom i have worked personally also miss nadia morena senior program officer from england she spoke about the sports for development in times of covid 19 she very well explained about the the philosophy of sports how we can develop our society through sports and management uh, she was introduced by banet batley who's a, who was who is the deputy director at western cop department of culture affairs and sport at south africa and after that at the last presentation before the last presentation one one presentation was also performed by professor gary from us he talk about the various aspects regarding the sports management how to uh, get the sports funding and uh, he was introduced by uh, one of our yes major ashim ashwin is very very intellectual talk and at the last uh, dr kathleen kratty uh, the unesco chair holder of inclusive education from ireland she very well talk about the inclusive education program how to uh, how to include uh, the para sports and other uh, the human affairs aspects and human rights affairs into the through friction sports activities so on my personal behalf as well as behalf of the international olympic uh, education and other academic committee thankful to each and every one all the speakers those who have enlightened our the, our family the olympic family on this on this day uh, two days webinar international webinar and enlightened us in a great manner uh it's uh, it is really a uh, latent uh, matter of proud for us that uh, this uh, we call webinar is very well very uh, very very bright manner broadcasted by uh, our one play sports i am thankful to shri mohit lalwani ji who is the ceo of first first play sports and special thanks to anubhav jain who all from the last two days continues with us and uh, and untiring starting doing their hard work to do each and every presentation in a successful manner and for i am also thankful to all the uh, facebook uh, youtube twitter and hello who has helped us in presenting this international webinar uh, almost uh, cover all of, all of the world basically and more than 1700000 people are directly enrolled with this program and i am also and this close thing sir may i am very fortunate and thanks to our chief guest of the day shri ramesh goel ji the vice chancellor of delhi pharmaceutical university who spare his valuable time and with us for this closing ceremony and uh, and give their open hand for this olympic education to the indian olympic association how to we can proceed with this we are really thankful to you sir i am also thankful to shri uh, anshul bhagel ji for his valuable advices plus uh, uh, interest interest regarding the olympic education and my spe special thanks to 
a very young Richard Ko, the president of Indian International Olympic Academy participation, participants. Uh, we welcome you, sir, and thanks to for accepting our invitations and uh, present their view and uh, always remain with us for the, such type of activities. I am also thankful to Hoshar Singh Ji, Joint Director from Haryana Sports Department, for accepting our invitation. And at last, it is my uh, mistake if not, it would I would not thanks to my uh, distinguished member of Indian Olympic Education. Olympic Education and other academic committee members. First of all, I would like to pay my sincere gratitude and thanks, indebted and grateful to our young professionalist and hardworking president uh, of this or chairman of this committee, who is the Secretary General of IKCA, Mr. Prashant Khushwadi. Thank you very much for enlightening us, guiding us in each and every manner. And I am also thankful to Mr. Kamlesh Nanavati, the Vice President of uh, Swing Federation of India and the member of this committee and the Joint Secretary uh, of this web international webinar. I'm also th thankful to Mr. Lakhya Konwar, the General Secretary of Assam Olympic Association and a member of this committee. I am also uh, pay my sincere gratitude to Mr. Sunil Alangam, the Secretary of Manipur Olympic Association. A whole member of this committee, and I am so thankful to Mr. Gurudatish Bhakta, the Secretary General of Goa Olympic Association, and the member of this committee. And at last, I am thankful to Dr. Sanjay Kumar Prajapati, Assistant Professor at Sports Authority of India, Trivandrum, who are untiringly doing a lot of efforts in putting this webinar in successful. Your dear friends. I am also thankful to various internationals and national organizations who are really uh, giving their uh, friendly hands to all of us, especially to this committee and Indian Olympic Association to make this program successful. I am sin uh, sincerely thanks, first of all, to our International Olympic Committee. With the blessing of this International Olympic Committee, we are with you. I am also thankful to our International Olympic Academy Participant Association. And also thankful to International Paradise Coveting Association Committee, sorry, and special thanks to Olympism for Humanity Alliance. And apart from those, various other international organizations are also with us. I could not able to, in a short of time, I could not able to name all of them, but by my sincere for a heart, I'm thankful to all of them also. At national level, also the various committees are working with us, various organizations are working with us untiringly to support us in promoting this Olympic education philosophy among the, especially in India and among the world. And first of all, I would pay my sincere gratitude for hardworking, uh, sincere, uh, what do you call, sincere Olympic value holder of this, of my country, India, Dr. Neeraj, who is the president of National Council of Sports Sciences and Physical Education. It has to you, sir, for all of your support and each and everything. And I am also thankful to Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Sports Foundation for their every type of assistance. I am also thankful to Indian Paradigm Corporate Institution, especially to Sarkar Sir for putting all efforts. My special thanks to Sculpting Mentors for their all type of assistance. And sincere gratitude and thanks to Kendriya Vidyalaya Sangathan for promoting each and every aspect of Olympic education. I am also thankful to Delhi Pharmaceutical University for putting their hands with the Indian Olympic Association and special contribution to our education committee. Apart from that, I, am, I have to pay my sincere thanks, gratitude, and what you call uh, uh, hats to the various projects which are going in, in India, especially in India for the Olympic education program. First of all, Olympic for Human for Humanity Alliance Indian chapter, Dr. Neeru Malik, fellow Punjab University working at Desmaj College. She is working really very hard for this Olympic education with open open edge community. My younger brother, Olympic education Chapal, who is holding by Dr. Bhi, Dr. Bhisham Singh. Dr. Mm -hmm. Olympic uh, Olympism Society, the founder Dr. Ramanivas. Thank you. 
Dr. Malik, are you still with us? I still see Dr. Malik. Uh, I believe the orientation of his screen may have changed a bit. Uh, but Dr. Malik, I think you were still audible. Not sure we'll give it a couple of seconds. Yes, yes, Dr. Malik. I believe I hear you right now. You can still carry on. We can still hear you, I believe. Okay, I will take up on behalf of Mr. Malik, if you don't mind. Yes, Mr. Kushwa. Yeah, I'm, uh, on behalf of Mr. Malik, I would like to thank and the organizing committee to everybody, Mr. Goel, uh, Mr. Lalwani, and everyone who is present there and has helped in making this event successful. And uh, obviously, your channel, who has been pushing it hard, and we got uh, uh, things in millions. Okay, and uh, we were we were very lucky to have good back back team support in form of Santoshi and. Venkat and obviously Neha daily we used to talk around four o'clock, three o'clock in the morning to make it happen. I'm very much thankful for all the team that has ha made this happen, uh, especially Anubhav also. No doubt from morning till nine, till nine is sitting. And uh, I'm extremely thankful to you also. And in the end, I would like to thank Mr. Goyal as well, who has given his valuable time because this time is comparatively in India is eight o'clock and he has he's this and you can see the and Thiyazam and his, his uh, approach towards this subject that he is available here. Thank you, sir, for everything, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kushwaha. Thank you so much for the, the kind words. Uh, I must say that uh, I'd be lying if I said the team here at One Place Sports has not been working uh, tirelessly. We certainly have been working tirelessly over the course of the last few days. Uh, but the only reason why we've been able to work with the bottomless reserves of energy has been because we've been working with people such as you who've uh, definitely injected so much energy and enthusiasm, which has been extremely contagious and has uh, given us... Uh, this uh, this energy when uh, you know we've been in most need of it, uh, Professor Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Jha. I know you weren't able to join us initially for the vote of thanks, uh, but you have joined us now. So would love uh, to uh, to have you on the stage as well uh, for some concluding remarks from you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Anubhav uh, Jain, and uh, it's my privilege that uh, I'm this uh, in this uh, valedictory function of this particular we webinar organized by Olympic Education Committee. I, I OA and I feel uh, very proud and I can say that uh, Mr. Prashant Kuswaha, uh, uh, Professor Ramesh and Mr. Ansul, Mr. Richard, Mr. Anson, Mr. Marjan, Dr. Rana Singh, then Mr. Yogendra Chaudhary and Mr. Hosiar Singh. A warm regards to all of you and everybody who has directly or indirectly participated in this particular international webinar. I can say as a president of uh, Indian Association of Physiotherapists being one of the largest and strongest association and oldest association of India in physiotherapy. Physiotherapists are uh, basically uh, are having a brain of scientist and heart of humanist. And I can also say that they are having the hands of artist. So physiotherapist uh, and L Olympic Association, Association of Physiotherapists with uh, Olympic sports and in this particular COVID-19 era, I can say and I can see that role of physiotherapist becomes more and more important. And why it is important? Because uh, you all know that uh, I don't need to explain much on this particular topic, but I can say that uh, now in this COVID era, keeping a sports person fit, it's becoming more and more challenging and not only challenging, making them uh, when we are going to bring back the sports arena back in the normal schedule, physiotherapists will have a very important role to play all over, right from beginning to the end till the uh, players comes into the ground and they really start playing. And we will have a tough time to bring all of them back to the sports arena and physiotherapist along with the sports person, keeping them fit, keeping them working, keeping them going, keeping them mentally fit as well, will be a difficult task. And we from uh, the side of Indian Association of Physiotherapists, I can assure that uh, we all physios from India are continuously growing and doing all the, the such type of webinars and in almost last two, three months of the, this lockdown period, IAP has already conducted more than 1000 webinars 
in different topics how to keep our sports person how to keep our patients mobile more better and in a more challenging way to cope up with all these situations i feel that uh, physiotherapist role and exercise role and immunity is also very important and we all should exercise should keep working to improve uh, immunity because i feel only medications or uh, other other uh, things will not help we all need to do exercise and we all need to improve our immunity through these exercises i feel that uh, being a largest association iap should uh, conduct more and more uh, webinars in association with indian olympic association and it will be our privilege to collaborate with the uh, such a privileged and such a renowned association and we all are there with all of you and i can say this from my this uh, opportunity that uh, physiotherapists are there with all the steps what Olymp olympic associations will be taking and from the side of iap i can say that we all are going to make every step very strong to make our all coming life easy and more better for our sports person and the common population as well looking forward for better coordination better collaboration and a better and a stronger healthy society in coming post covid era so we all are going to work together and i hope such type of programs such type of conferences and such type of collaborations are very important to keep our society and nation fit so this is a more stronger time more better time to collaborate and to make our sports person and to make our society our nation and international arena also more fit so yes physiotherapist role are very important let's all collaborate and sign off with a very stronger and collaborative sense that we all will be working together to make our society healthier thank you thank you doctor thank you anurag sir mr jha can i have uh, one request for you so mr yeah, jha yeah. i might be i might be in uh, need of some physiotherapy having been fixed to my chair these past couple of days so when can i schedule an appointment with you any time but uh, in covid era where you are right now i don't know but yes uh, any time on uh, video sharing uh, we can have some uh, whatsapp chat let's see we can work out no problem brilliant we can perhaps do one on our one play sports platforms you know given the success of this uh, virtual webinar that we've seen uh, over the course of the last two days uh, so we'll conclude proceedings on uh, that light hearted note it's been a pleasure on behalf of everyone here at one play sports it's been an absolute pleasure to have worked uh, in conjunction with the indian olympic association as well as the indian olympic education committee in uh, bringing this uh, international webinar on olympism and olympic education in the 21st century to all the masses all across the world the support the comments the the likes the share as the feedback that we received from everyone tuning in from all across the world on our one play sports networks has been absolutely phenomenal heartwarming and staggering keep up the support we thank you wholeheartedly for uh, your engaging feedback uh, and just one parting request uh, would love for you guys to follow our pages as well of course we broadcast this live on facebook on uh, hello on twitter on uh, youtube as well on instagram so follow us across uh, all our pages uh, as we continue to uh, deliver cater to your requests and bring live content to you all year round uh, on behalf of the one play sports family on behalf of the indian olympic education and the indian olympic education committee thank you so much for having joined us over the course of the last two days and uh, we wish you all the very best and stay safe thank you olympism is a philosophy of life that glorifies and combines the qualities of body mind and will It is based on the joy of effort, the educational value of a good example, social responsibility, and respect for fundamental ethical principles. The goal is to build a peaceful and better world by educating youth through the practice of sport without discrimination of any kind, and in the Olympic spirit of friendship, solidarity, and fair play. Join us in blending sport with culture and education. through Indian Olympic Education Committee at international webinar on the 11th and the 12th of June with leading speakers to move forward with Olympism 
and Olympic education in the 21st century. Brought to you live and exclusive on One Play Sports Channel.